podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, 21 August 2022. This is episode 1920. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Noom. With their psychology first approach, Noom Weight empowers you to build more sustainable habits and behaviors. Sign up for your trial at noom.com slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, space, EVs, uh, virtual reality goggles, whatever is on your mind. If it has to do with tech, this is the place for it. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. We all struggle. We wrestle daily, each and every one of us with technology in some form or fashion and this is the place you can come, the safe space, <laughs> where no technology, no AI is listening in, and we can talk about the robots freely. What do you think? You know, if I, if this show, let's say this show makes it to, I don't know, 2100, or 100 years from now, how about that, 2122, do you think the conversation will be like, oh, hi, Leo, I, I can't speak too loudly because the AI might be listening, but it seems to be acting strangely. <laughs> I, You know, I completely think that's possible. I completely think that's possible. We're, we're headed that way, aren't we? It's, uh, I don't know. It, it's looking at me funny. It's inside the house. We're, we're, I mean, already, even in, in the year 2022, we're kind of struggling with technology that is not responsive to our human needs, inflicted on us by other humans, yes, so there's that. But nevertheless, you know, you're caught in a, caught in a loop. There's a story in the New York Times today about a father whose uh, baby boy was having trouble medical trouble and uh he called the doctor and they said send a picture of the problem and he did but uh the problem was uh you know you know uh, uh, an intimate part of the kid's anatomy but you know I the doctor will often ask you now it, and this was during covid so it's not unusual for the doctor said you know strange mole okay send me a picture Right? I'll, and then uh, we can go from there. So not unusual, not weird. Father complied. I think he even sent a video. What the father didn't think about was uh, that his phone, uh, as, as my, maybe yours is, automatically uploaded um, everything, all the pictures and video, to Google. Perhaps yours does that too, or or perhaps it does it to uh, Apple's iCloud or, or others. And maybe you know, I don't know. Maybe you know uh, that these companies uh, are running scanners, artificial intelligence, not human scanners that look at those pictures and decide, hey, wait a minute, this is problematic, and then send them to NCMEC, the the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, because. They're concerned it might be uh, CSAM, child sex abuse material, you know, illegal. <sighs> Nick Mick has a database of uh, such material, compares it to that first, and then if it doesn't match, which I'm sure in this case it did not, uh, then a human looks at it and says, trouble. Um, Google immediately disabled his Gmail account uh, and called the police. Called the police. Uh, the police in San Francisco investigated and said, oh yeah, it's what you said it is. No crime occurred. Um, in fact, they sent him a letter in December of last year saying, you've been investigated. 
Uh, we set search warrants to Google and your ISP, your internet search provider, an investigator, uh, looked at everything in your Google account, your internet searches, your location history, your messages, any documents, photos, or video stored with Google, which on many phones is everything. Uh, and uh, ruled that no crime occurred, case closed. Uh, the investigator wrote, I determined the incident did not meet the elements of a crime, no crime occurred. So uh, the father said, could you tell Google I'm innocent? Because everything I do is in Google. My, my, not only my mail, but I have a Google Fi phone. So that was disconnected. Everything I do with Google was, was blocked and disconnected. The police officer said, you, ha you have to talk to Google. There, there's nothing I can do. Uh, once again, the dad appealed the case to Google. Even sent them the police report saying no crime has occurred. Your two months later, his account permanently deleted, gone. His phone number changed, his email changed, which made it very difficult for him <laughs> to uh, pursue this. Right? Decade-old Google account gone. Phone number gone. All those documents, all those photos stored with Google gone. Google being a giant artificial intelligence had decided. The great and powerful Oz has decided. And that's that. Doesn't matter what the police say. Doesn't matter at all. Doesn't matter the story. Uh, what's the message here? I don't know. Maybe, be, I guess, you know, uh, next time your physician says, can you send me a picture fax it. I don't <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. But this is an important thing to remember that everything, you know, if you have an iPhone, everything is going to Apple unless you explicitly turn it all off. If you have an Android phone, it's all going to Google and whoever makes the phone unless you explicitly turn it off. Most of it leave it on because it's a backup, it's a convenience. Did the father do anything wrong? No. Did Google do something wrong? Yes. <laughs> Is there anything that can be done? No. He did contact a lawyer. The uh, lawyer said, well, yeah, you could sue, but it's going to cost you. And the dad decided, yeah, I'm not, I can't spend the $7,000 I'm going to need to retain this lawyer and, and sue. So he didn't. There's an example of the AI... <laughs> In the year 2022, already providing problems. Sigh. Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook fella. Remember him? Posted a, uh, you know, they announced their new Facebook virtual reality thing. <laughs> and uh, Mark, you know, all excited about this, posted a picture of himself to massive mockery on the internet. That they spent ten billion dollars in many years creating this, and that's what they got," said the internet. <laughs> Ooh, uh, yeah. New York Times columnist Kevin Roos said the graphics were worse than a a two thousand eight Wii video game. <laughs> Eye gougingly ugly," says Twitter, an international laughing stock. Um. <laughs> Zuck, I guess, saw them because uh, Friday he announced uh, uh, <laughs> Horizon Worlds. This is the virtual reality world. Horizon Worlds. We're going to see big updates, big updates. Uh, Mark said in his best robot voice, because I think Mark might be an AI. I know the photo I posted earlier this week was pretty basic. It was taken very quickly to celebrate a launch. <laughs> we are capable of much more and it will be improving very quickly. <laughs> okay. $10 billion, significant resources. In fact, Facebook says this is the next big thing. We're going to, we're not even going to be a social network anymore. We're going to be a virtual reality environment, horizon worlds. But we're going to make Mark look better next time. <laughs> Have you seen it? Because it doesn't look, it doesn't, it's not, mm -mm. it's not.
That's not good. <laughs> I took it quickly. Mark, Mark, you're you're one of the richest men in the world, owner outright of one of the biggest, most fancy ex company. I mean, what kind of who what kind of company could spend ten billion dollars in a year on a project? This is not the first time Mark has posted strange stuff. Remember uh, 4th of July uh, last year? He posted a, a video of him holding an American flag on a, on a, on a surfboard, <laughs> surfing on the wake of a, of a boat. Remember that? Well, I am just like a normal human, he says. Honest. I am, I am a metaverse skeptic. I'm a, you know what? I, it didn't used to be this way. But I become skeptical about many, many things in the, the technology space. I used to be uh, one of those wide-eyed optimists, uh, embracing every new development, every new gadget. Isn't this great? The iPhone 7. Oh, my gosh, the best iPhone since the iPhone 6. You know, that kind of guy. But I've been doing this a long time now. <laughs> it's hard not to turn to a little bit of a cynic. You, t you know, you come to me and say, Web3 going to be the latest, greatest thing. And I go, yeah, okay. As long as you don't ask for my money. Oh, no, we need your money. No. Bitcoin, going to be huge. No. Virtual reality, the next big thing, eh, makes me a little nauseated, actually. I guess I'm a boomer. <laughs> I guess I'm a boomer. Uh, I apologize. If you're all excited about Web3 and cryptocurrency and virtual reality and augmented reality, I apologize. And you know, I will be the first to eat my virtual hat should this stuff take off. Right here, on the air, on the national airwaves, coast to coast. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number if you want to call and talk about tech. That's the number to call. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, use Skype. Website, techguylabs.com. Your calls next. Hey, Schaffer. Hey. <laughs> Cute outfit. Thanks. I like it. Are you expecting warm weather? I am. Okay. <laughs> it has been. I know. You know, I miss it because I'm inside all day in the yeah, air conditioning. Yeah, well, and it's overly air conditioned in it's here. It's highly air conditioned. Yep. And uh, I heard that it was like 96 degrees yesterday. Oh, yeah. I was going through the Novato Narrows and my car said 96 and said, oh, I'm <gasps> glad I'm in this car with yeah. air conditioning. <laughs> Today they say 80, but it could be worse. We just, they've been wrong a lot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, um, it got I'll, to 100 last week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I live in San Rafael, but Is San, San Rafael San Rafael's is cooler than here, cooler right? Cooler than where I live. So uh, I live in a little valley where it's like 10 or 15 degrees hotter than the, oh, the Lord. temperature says. And we moved to Petaluma all those years ago, more or 30 years ago. We moved here because it was slightly, it was warmer and sunnier than uh, San Francisco, which is... Oh, for sure. ...socked in most of the summer. I remember. Yeah, that's where people go for relief. Yeah. <laughs> I remember a 4th of July party we had in San Francisco. We had a people came from Marin, so they're in shorts and tank tops, and we had to lend them coats and gloves. And well, that's the that's the gimmick is everybody goes into San Francisco and has to buy the SF fleece hoodie. Yeah, <laughs> it's so cold there. They think, oh, it's California; it'll be yeah. nice and warm. Uh, I vividly uh, remember laughing at tourists on the Golden Gate Bridge as they froze, shivering, <laughs> shivering, froze their way. In the Bay Area, we have this thing called microclimates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The, I mean, the bridge is, is ice cold all the time. I mean, yeah, it's it's time, like winter. Yeah. It doesn't snow, but it's like but winter. But the whole country has been going through a heat wave. And have you seen all the memes online of like San yeah. Francisco just laughing? <laughs> we're like, yeah, we're the only cold place. <laughs> but we still have a drought. And uh -huh. uh, that drought is now spreading to the whole Southwest. Yep. Arizona is just drying up and. Well, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, caramba. Dead bodies in Lake Mead because it's so low. I know. Isn't that weird? It's so bizarre. They're going to find so many people. I have a isn't that weird? <laughs> you know, have you, you ever watched the show Yellowstone? I need to. Oh, My so whole good. family loves it. And I have, I, I, I cannot a, get past the dead horse scene in the first episode. Yeah. There's a place they uh, call the train station <laughs> that, you know, when they want to, because it's basically the Sopranos in a ranch. So when they want to 
off somebody, they say, "Oh, we'll give you a ride to the train station," <laughs> and they and it's a it's a gully out of state, just across state lines, and you know their thought is, "Well, nobody will ever see this." But I think it's like Lake Mead. I think <laughs> someday, I think someday, <laughs> someday. somebody's going to go, whoa, what happened here? Yeah. Yeah. That's... It's, it's, it's just TV. Probably there's no such. Except this is real life <laughs> in, Lake at Mead Lake Mead. <laughs> it is kind of real. Yeah. A lot of stuff happened in Las Vegas in the, what, 50s? I guess you're right. That's that's where probably if you were a gangster. Yeah. That's what you would... They'll never find them. They'll, They'll never... be a... Thousands of in the year twenty one twenty two. All right, let's uh, let's do a thing here. Let's do a thing. I feel the music wrapping up. It is wrapping up. A little Stevie Wonder to introduce the one, the only Kim Schaffer. Good morning. We have to introduce her because she is the one your first contact when you approach this show. Before you can poke me with a stick, you have to go to the zookeeper <laughs> and and say, "Hey." Let me in. And Kim is like the 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 the, the keeper of the the zoo. <laughs> I'm pretty easy. Maybe a little too nice. <laughs> Are you too nice? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You're very nice. Everybody always says that. Oh, you're lucky to have Kim. Yeah. In fact, that's really the, my life. They say the same thing about my wife. <laughs> they say the same thing about John, our studio man. Oh, you're lucky to have them. That is true. What did I do to be so lucky? You won the I won the lottery. Lottery, <laughs> lottery of life. The lottery of life. I'm a lucky, lucky guy. Although the implication is you don't deserve it. I like, don't think so. I don't know. I know. I don't think that's, that's what that I know means. what they're I saying. I know what I understand. You're very lucky. You're I'm, blessed. I'm just lucky. Yes. That's just the way it is. Who should I uh who should I start with? Let's go to Chuck in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He might have their lady called, lost her email address, and Oh yeah, this was a Yahoo he, problem he way might back have when. A test of whether that account is still I love in it. existence. I or love not. it that our audience is <laughs> still solving problems from weeks weeks gone by. Hey Chuck, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey Leo, um, listen, I had a possible solution, and it used to work in the old days. But um, uh, when you sent an email to a non-existent account, it usually bounced. And I'm oh, yeah, if, that's a I'm good idea. Cheap. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, so she uh, sent it, tried to send an email, obviously from a different account, or had a friend send an email to her, or just ask her friends, what are you getting when you try to send me email? And if it doesn't say, oh, no such person at this account, well, at least that that address exists. Her, I think yeah, her well, fear yeah. is that, yeah, it exists, but somebody else has access to it. Yeah. Uh, the other two things, a uh, slight uh, question is, I was going to uh, fault you on saying abacuses, but uh, then I checked myself and uh, found that uh, it's not abacai. It is also abacus. It's not a Latin word, right? Is well, that it, it is a Latin word. Oh, it is. Well, so Latin, it would yeah. be abacus abacai. Abacuis abacui. Qui quai quad, quius quius quius. I remember that. No, but I checked that, and uh, it, they do allow for abacuses. Oh, that's good. What a relief. And all. Also, for believe me, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I was completely wrong. So, <laughs> no, no, you're right. Abacuses. You're right. Now, what's the plural of mouse? Well, I was wondering what is it, what's the plural of buses. Bus. Uh, what's the plural of right. a bus? There you go. A bus would be a buy. Buy. It's a buy. Two buses yeah. is a buy. Yeah, yeah and, that's. Uh, I studied. I was. I feel very fortunate. I'm of a certain age where, in fact, we studied Latin in high school. And it was very yeah. useful, still is, to for my English comprehension. I've got a few years on you, too. Yeah. So, Did you study Latin in school? No, I studied French. Yeah, me too. French, Latin. And then I got to college and I got cocky. And I said, let me study ancient Greek. That'll be useful. I speak modern Greek. Do you? Are you Greek? Yeah. No. Oh. Scandahoovian. How, how is it that you come to speak Greek? Uh, my first base of station, uh, Air Force ah. uh, station, was in Greece. Beautiful, love Greece. During the during the Vietnam years, and uh, I met uh, Adrian Cronauer there. No kidding, he's the good born in Vietnam. Right, yeah. Played by uh, Robin Williams. Right, 
Uh, wow, Adrian Cronauer. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was. He made famous by that movie. Was he a cool guy? Yeah. Did he say yeah. good morning, Chuck? He was very, he was very popular there. Uh, even uh, this was in the. This is on the island of Crete. Uh huh. So he was a DJ on Armed Forces Radio in Crete. Right. Nice. Yeah. Well, there's a there's a brush with celebrity, you know. Next time you see that, every once in a while they they'll say that on Twitter. So sell, share your brush with fame, and you could say, "Well, I met Adrian Cronauer," and people go, "Who? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that?" <laughs> All wait, right. Wait. Well, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate the. Uh... Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait. there's more. Wait, but wait, there's more. Yeah. Uh, two things. Two slight things more. Last week you said it being uh, um, Lefties Week. Yes. Uh, the word sinister. Ah, uh, yes. Another uh, Latin word. Is also, and also you know what? Le like sinister that. means left, but you know what right is? Uh, no. Dexter, as in dexterous. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, right. So we lefties are sinister, and you righties are dexterous. Yeah, How yeah. wooed. And uh, one other slight thing. You came back from a cruise, but you never say where you went. Uh, we went to Alaska. Ah, Alaska. So you was, went on Holland America? Or we did on Holland. Very good. Yes, Holland America. We uh, went on the Eurodam. It was a uh, twit cruise, which sounds like it's a bad thing, but it's a good thing. It was. Uh, we took 111 of our uh, podcast listeners, and I think a few radio listeners. Hello, uh, on that cruise. <laughs> it was great fun. Oh yeah, I, I, I did Holland America down the uh, Mexican Riviera. I've done that one uh, too. Yeah. Yeah, done that one. Uh, I too. like that they had a they had a skating rink uh, there. <laughs> they did on the on the boat. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's the new thing. I don't. You know, their boats are so big. They're like little apartment complexes. I went on one that had bumper cars, a rock climbing wall. Uh, yeah, I did that. Parachuting, surfing, all on the boat. Hey, got to run. Thank you, Chuck. Sam and Bull, Sam and Car Guy, coming up. Good morning, Vietnam. Hello, Samuel. Hello, Leo. <clears throat> oh, you are sitting in front of a Dodge Charger. Dodge Charger Daytona SRT. I want to hear that sound, the V8 sound coming out of that fine, powerful engine. Do you think I can Let's find see, can it? Can you hear it now? Is that coming through? No, are you playing it? Uh, it should be playing. Uh, let me see if I can get it online mm -hmm. here. Yeah, I got it. That's why. Uh, that's why I had the video. I was hoping to be able to play it through for Good you. Good old Dodge. What have you done this uh, time? This is some Not YouTuber is going to talk for an hour before he plays it. Here it is. Uh, Here it let's is. See. Let's see. Hey, if you want help, oh, going? YouTubers, I hate you. There we go. Can you you should be able to hear it from my no. feed now. Not at all. Not at all. Doesn't exactly sound like a V8. It's it's a it's a different kind of sound. It's a fake V8, electric V. Now are they doing that? It's, it's the Banshee. Oh, it That's is. the name of the powertrain. They call it the Banshee powertrain. But it's electric. Yeah. But this is not the sound of the Banshee. This is the sound they recorded. Right? It's the sound they the sound they made up to represent the Banshee. Here it is. Not that. Is that just something that... What is that? Yeah. That's, that's basically it idling. It sounds like uh, electronic music. Well, then as it revs, um, you'll hear it. It's the Fratzonic chambered exhaust system. <laughs> Fratzonic? Did they yeah. Make, they made that up. They did. The, the, uh, the logo, the, the Dodge logo, which is the old... Three Delta Here logo from the 1960s. Bring it back for this. Oh, it's very electronic. That's interesting. Yeah, I guess that, they didn't want it to sound. That logo um, on the front. Yeah, that's called the Fratzog, which is which is the designer made that name up. <laughs> wow, wow. Actually, you know, wouldn't this is the mod, this is the new the next, but it's a concept, right? It's not a. It, it, well, it's a concept, but a production version is coming in 2024. See, I kind of be very kinda, much like this. I kind of like the idea of a muscle car. You know, you still get a muscle car, but it's electric muscles. Well, and that's that's the whole point here. That's yeah. that's what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, 
Yeah. Fretzog. Yes, he said Fretzog. Yep. He did. He said it. <laughs> Hello, Fretzog. Wow. Wow. All I could say is wow. Good. This will be fun to talk about, actually. There's so much automotive news now. As I go through my news uh, stuff, I see all this automotive stuff now. Just it's it's really happening. But I was oh, yeah. a little distressed when I saw that. Uh, what was it? Was it GM plans to make half of its vehicles electric by 2050? And I thought 2050. No, 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 no. 2030. Oh. Somebody said 2050. I don't know who it was. And I thought, God, I'll be 96 years old. No, it, every every automaker is well ahead of that. They're, Most of them are yeah. targeting at least at least 50 percent by 2030. Yeah. Um, some you know some some brands like Volvo, Jaguar are planning to be fully electric by 2030. Yeah. Why why your seven sages says EVs are not the future, they're a daydream, the reality of which is taking a rather long time to sink in the denial and delusion. I wonder well, who's really you're, in denial he, and delusion he's, he's, here. He, he's wrong. <laughs> you just wait and they, see. They are they are real. Yeah. I yeah. drive them all the time. I drive all we have now is a bolt, yeah. a, a mini, and a Mustang, all of which are EVs, battery electric vehicles. But I am deluded, clearly. Uh, we all are, I guess. And I have to say, not having gone to a gas station in a couple of years, the delusion is strong. You just <laughs> wait and see. <laughs> the vision is a daydream. Well, we'll see. It may well be that car, personal car ownership dies, but we'll see. Hey, it's time to talk cars. I'm doing it already with Sam Abul Samad. He's a principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. This is his day job, but he also does the great podcast, Wheel Bearings. You'll find that at wheelbearings.media and wherever you get your podcasts. And today, Sammy is sitting in front of a very nice Dodge Charger. Hello, Sam. Hello, Leo. How are you this week? I'm great. I'm great. So this week uh, is, is a big week in the, in the car biz. Yes. Because right now... Uh, down in Monterey, south of you guys, uh, the Pebble Beach Concours is going on. This has been oh, Monterey I love Car this. Week, and there's been love all this. kinds of fancy stuff uh, yeah. unveiled there. And, and uh, my podcast co-host Roberto Baldwin's been down there, lucky dog, uh, for the last several days, hobnobbing with the fancy people. <laughs> um, the Concours d'Elegance. Yeah. Me meanwhile, I was back here in Detroit because uh, yesterday was the annual Woodward Dream Cruise, and uh, so this is. Uh, this massive event that's been going on for many, many years on Woodward Avenue in Detroit. Oh, that's fun. Uh, people getting out their, their cool cars and interesting cars and sometimes not so interesting cars and just driving up and down Woodward Avenue. But that's, a, and, that's every Saturday in Petaluma. Uh, well, yeah, and it is most Saturdays on Woodward <laughs> Avenue, too. Okay, good. <laughs> but, 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 but this particular Saturday is when they have, you have about a million people actually go out and nice. sit along, uh, along the sidewalks and everything all the way up and down, like about an 10 mile stretch of Woodward uh, from Detroit up to Pontiac uh, to watch these cars. And as part of the, this celebration of uh, automotive culture um, for a number of years, you know, some, some of the automakers that are based here in Detroit have been uh, doing some, some special events, some announcements and Dodge, uh, which, you know, has really transformed itself into a muscle car brand over the last decade, especially the last five or six years since they launched the, the supercharged Hellcat V8s. Um, has been doing some some stuff they do. Um, earlier in the week, they did something called Roadkill Nights at a local racetrack nearby where they, uh, you know, people come in and, and drag race. Um, and earlier this week, they unveiled a couple of new products. Uh, oh, they made, se they made several announcements. Um, the first big announcement was that by the end of next year, the Hellcat V8 will be dead. Um, gas powered, the gas powered Dodge Charger and Challenger will end production by the end of 2023. Um, they followed that up the next night by introducing the Dodge Hornet, which is their new um, plug-in hybrid uh, compact crossover. Uh, and then on Wednesday night, they showed off this car. And if you're watching the stream right now, you can see behind me the Dodge Charger Daytona SRT. Um, last year when Stellantis, which is the parent company of Dodge and 13 other brands, uh, had their EV day to announce their their 
the roadmap for EVs uh, that talked about Dodge going electric and introducing an um, American e-muscle car in an 2023. E- e-muscle. E-muscle. But you and know, the most important cars. part of a muscle car, because I used to own a Mustang, mm-hmm. GT 5.0, is how are you going to do that with electric? Well, and and this is one of the challenges with with going electric because you know with with internal combustion <laughs> engines, you know different engines have different sounds, different feels. You know you can create product differentiation by the way the engine sounds and, and vibrates and everything. And electric motors are all pretty much the same. So uh, the guys at Dodge decided to have a little fun with this vehicle and and with their upcoming vehicles. So, you know, we know, you know, you, we've seen from Tesla that uh, an electric car can be just as much of a muscle car as anything with a big, giant supercharger. Well, better, V8. really? I mean, and, better. And, and quicker, yeah. Yeah, quicker. I had much better pickup on my electric Mustang Mach-E than I did on my GT 5.0. Right. Yeah. And so you're going to have that in this car when the production model comes out in 2024. <laughs> but... Um, then it wouldn't be any different from a Tesla in that respect. Yeah, so Tesla came go, up with something different when they when they, they get fast. They, so so they they created something that they have filed for a patent on called the Fratsonic chambered exhaust. Wait, what? So the Fratsonic chambered, chambered exhaust. Exhaust. So Can I the, play that for the, you? Uh, yeah. Well, here. Let me let me try. No, no, you can't. You I have it. Let me play oh, it okay. for you. This sounds like a Marvel movie sound effect. That's actually going to come out of the car. It's a, it's playing yeah. through a speaker, though, right? It's not. Sort of, yes. It's it's more it's more than that. It's not just a speaker. Um, so uh, as they as you know, Dodge, the head of Dodge, described it to me. You know, it's a transducer, which of course oh, is what a speaker is. That's a, a speaker. <laughs> it's a speaker. <laughs> but we it call it the Fret Sonic transducer, my resonance friend. Resonance chamber. It's an FST. Uh, it goes into this resonance chamber in a series of pipes. Oh, listen, the revs. And but it's clear they're not tr- they're not trying to make it sound analog. I mean, you could record an analog oh, yeah. engine and, and that's been done. Yeah, yeah. Others have done that. They want and, to make it yeah. sound a little electronic. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, different different automakers are doing different solutions for their, their sounds. I mean, you've got a little rumbling sound when you put your Mach-E into its unbridled mode. Um, BMW hired uh, Fra- um, Hans Zimmer, the, the movie composer, yeah. to do the uh, soundtrack cool. for their EVs. Yeah, why not and, make it sound different? Yeah, and so Dodge has come up with with this system that looks at the accelerator pedal position, the uh, gear position, the load, the speed, uh, to try to match the sound to what the vehicle's doing. And it doesn't sound like, like a V8. This is what it should sound like. A TIE fighter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, the, but one of the interesting details, they said that this, you know, at full, you know, full acceleration, maximum acceleration, this thing will be able to go up to 126 decibels, the same sound oh. level as the Hellcat. That's, da- so that's ear damaging. Don't, no, stop it. Yeah. <laughs> It's, no, it's, well, it's, the, it's the same the same sound level as the Hellcat. Why but, would they you know, do that? Ver- I don't know. That it's, should be illegal. Silly. Yeah, that should be illegal. I know that some states in Florida they had they had to make it illegal. People were playing really loud sounds from their car. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, no, that's just noise pollution. Yeah, and and it won't be doing that all the time. You know, it, I think I suspect what they're going to do is probably do some geofencing. So if you're at a drag strip, and then it could do you know, it. Yeah. Running at a drag yeah. strip, yeah, it's not. Gonna, it's probably not going to do that. Are they going to have somebody in the chat room says Vegas Wayne says they should they should have a sol- a solenoid that rocks the car when the <laughs> don't give them any ideas. They, they probably will. I, mean, I well, think this is I mean, really just trying to convince the muscle car crowd yes. that this is really a muscle car. And you know what? That's a short-term fool's errand. You know, if I think in the long run, make it fast, make it look good, make it work well, and they'll come along. It's silly to have a 120 decibel engine roar playing out of a speaker. That's crazy. It, yes, that, that volume is pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, but it does sound really Although cool. that is how hear. loud. I, I heard it on Wednesday night, and it does sound Yeah, cool. that's how loud uh, my friend's Harley is. <laughs> 
Yeah. I always know well, when he's arriving the, out it's, front. <laughs> and it's the, sa- it's the same volume as the current V8 Charger and Challenger with the wow. Hellcat engine. Wow. So it's not any louder. Uh, and uh, so, you know, this is this is coming in 2024. Um, this user sixty two fifty five says, "Why don't they just put baseball cards in the spokes of the tires?" And then, because <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. It's like a kid going, yeah. vroom, 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 vroom. Pretty, "Look at me, much, yeah. vroom, vroom, vroom. got big loud engine." Vroom, 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 vroom. But if you if you want to hear more about this, um, when I <laughs> later this afternoon when I put up the uh, new episode of Wheel Bearings, I've got interviews with uh, Tim Kaniskas, who is the head of Dodge, and Mickey Bly. Who is the head of, uh, or he's he's uh, head of uh, global propulsion systems for Stellantis, um, and I've also got an interview in there with uh, Jim Owens, who I talked to on Friday, who is the marketing and brand awesome. manager for Mustang and Shelby at Ford, uh, awesome. and, Mu- and Ford's going to be unveiling the new EV uh, Mustang. In uh, oh, it's uh, it's a, a Mustang body, yeah, 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 yeah. That's wheelbearings.media. Yep. Uh, very nice, Sam Abul Samet. He is uh, he's a guy who studies this for a living at Guidehouse Insights. He's also the podcaster at Wheelbearings.media. Thank you, Sam. Leo Laporte. Thank, Thank you, Leo. I always when I'm looking, there's so many EVs on the road out here now uh, that uh, you can and they can no longer can you tell they don't look like martini olives anymore. They you know they look like real cars. So I just every time I just look for tailpipes. No tailpipe. <laughs> it's an EV. Sometimes yeah. that's the only way you could tell these days. And sometimes not even then, because most of the hybrids usually right. hide the tailpipe behind the, the bumper cover in the back, so you can't oh, even see the tailpipe on those either. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Huh. Um, so. Would you like to uh, take control of the radio for a few minutes? Certainly. Oh, thank you. I give so, it to you. Eric Duckman. Um, or uh, no, sorry, one Brian says fake smoke out the tailpipe. Uh, no plans for that at this time, uh, but you know they don't talk about future products, so <laughs> uh, that you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it past them. It they, could happen. Look, they 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 probably I don't think they'll have smoke out the tailpipes, but they will in fact uh, be able to generate a lot of smoke from tire spin <laughs> at the drag strip when you when you stand on this thing. That's true. Uh, That's a good they, point. Yes, they, they haven't they haven't said exactly how much power this thing's going to have. Uh, but they said that it will be faster than the Hellcat in every wow. spec. Uh, and the the current Hellcat Red Eye uh, is like 807 horsepower, um, but it also doesn't have uh, all-wheel drive and doesn't have electric motors, so it doesn't have that instant torque. Uh, so this, um, you know, this this will un- certainly be quicker, even if it doesn't necessarily have as much power. Uh, but they've said that it's going to come out with three power levels from the factory. And then using things like uh, software updates, you'll be able to upgrade to, you know, up to six, uh, at least six other power levels. So they're going to have a lot of options for customizing this thing. Wow. Um, let's see. Uh, Scooter X says, Tim Stevens got to drive some nice vehicles last week. Yeah, Tim Tim usually gets to drive some nice vehicles. He is no longer uh, at CNET. I was so sad nope, to see he, uh he has separated from CNET, yeah. um, and I'm not at liberty to talk about what went on there, but uh-huh. I've, I've heard some stuff, and it's it's unfortunate. Well, you have uh, to tell me off the air. All, or st- I'll ask it, Tim, but yeah, uh-huh. yeah, it's it's I mean, it's all part of the whole private equity thing. Yep, Red Ventures. Um, yep, mm-hmm. that's let's see. Uh, uh, that's really sad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they they've gutted the. I don't they, think they have they roadshow the anymore, video right? Team There's roadshow. no roadshow, or is there? No, they 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 changed roadshow back to CNET Autos, right? Um, and uh, uh, they got rid of the entire video team. There's only four people left on CNET Autos now. Oh, that's sad. So they got rid of quite a few people, uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah, well, we knew this would happen once once you know equity company you know companies get a hold of you. That's the first thing they do is start to save money. Yep. Uh, so Joe asks, uh, Texas grid can't handle cold weather. How are they going to handle people switching to EVs? And, and this is a, ma- a major issue. Uh, you know, we I would submit you know, that's I, a problem for Texas as opposed to EVs, but okay. Well, it, it, is, a prob- it is particularly <laughs> it's a, problem a problem for, for Texas. Poorly run grid. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's independent from the rest of the grid across the country. Yeah, that's uh, part of the problem. Yeah, uh, but, you know, there... 
even in, even in the rest of the country, we need some significant upgrades to sure. the grid. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have enough power generation capability. What we, you know, I was, I had uh, coffee last week with somebody from uh, one of the utilities here in Michigan. Uh, and she said, she told me, you know, the challenge is to get the electrons to the right place at the right time. Um, you know, they've, they've got plenty of electrons. They just, they have to distribute them better. Um, and so we're seeing uh, a variety of things going on. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next segment, if you want. Yeah. Good. Stick around. Awesome. Sure. We'll talk in a bit. Thank you, Sam. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Noom. You may have noticed how svelte, how handsome, how trim and fit I am. Maybe you haven't noticed that. Have you, you, I know you've noticed it with my wife. We've been doing Noom. I love the Noom. One of our uh, one of the chatters who was on the uh, cruise with us. I don't I won't name names because I don't want to embarrass him. Uh, he, I said, I didn't recognize him. I knew he was going to be on the cruise. I said, where are you? And he said, I'm right here. I went, what? He said, yeah, I lost 60 pounds. I said, how'd you do it? I said, he said, Noom. I listened to your ads, Noom. I love Noom. Noom weight is a way to lose weight. It's not a diet. It's understanding, it's knowledge, and that's what's so important because knowledge is power. And if you understand why you eat, what you're eating, why you're eating it, you have control over it. And so there's no bad foods. You don't have to suffer. <laughs> uh, I asked him, he said, no, I love it. He's still on it. And so is Lisa. Lisa is now a, has a, a life member. You know, after, after you've, you've reached your goal weight, which she has, uh, and then you continue to maintain, and then eventually you get the Zoom, you know, Lifetime Achievement Award. I don't know what they call it, but I'm jealous because I'm not yet there, but she is. I lost about 20 pounds with, with Noom. She didn't need to lose as much. I think she's lost 10. Looks great. She did it at first because she wanted to support me. I said, I'm going to do Noom. This is about a year and a half ago, a year ago. I said, I'm going to do Noom. She said, okay. And after I did it for a few days, she said, you know, I should do it too. I said, good, great. You don't need to, but she did. She said, well, I have a few pounds I'd like to lose. As you get older, you know, this is one of the things that happens as you get older. Every decade, it's another 10 pounds, right? Well, I got to tell you, I've done every diet in the world, but Noom Weight is not a diet. It's a psychology-first approach that helps you build sustainable habits with lasting results. Noom Weight has now helped 3.6 million people lose weight. Every journey is different. So when you do Noom Weight, you get an app. On your iPhone or your Android device, uh, it helps you track what you're eating, but it also has lessons. But your lessons are different. Mine were different than Lisa's the, uh, because our goals were different. It's based on scientific principles like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. You might have heard of CBT. It's all about understanding your relationship with food. For instance, I learned I am a fog eater. I, sometimes I don't even taste the food. So one of the first things, one of the first things we did with Noom, turn off the TV, put down the phone, put it away, chew slowly, taste every bite. Makes just by itself, it makes a big, big, big difference. Noom. The other thing that happened with Noom, you get the plan, you get the lessons, you also get a group that you can participate in. Some people like groups. I'm not a big group guy. You also get a coach. I'm more of a coach, worked with a coach. First, one of the first things that happened about two weeks in, I ate a hot dog. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I ate a hot dog. She said, no, no, that's not, that's okay. I said, what? She said, oh, no, there's no bad foods on Noom. It's not about restricting what you can or can't eat. It focuses on progress instead of perfection and learning, right? So you lose the desire for stuff you that's not good for you in a way because you understand why you're eating it. And by the way, you can even choose how much uh, of your coach you get, how much of the group, how much, how long the lessons are. You can have five minute daily check ins if you want. You can have them weekly. Uh, there are off days, of course. Noom weight helps you get back on track. Active Noomers lose an average of 15 pounds in 16 weeks. That's, that's actually I lost a little more than that. 95% of customers say Noom Weight is a good long-term solution. I have kept it off, even through a cruise. In fact, I did not gain weight on the cruise. Lisa lost a pound on the cruise. It makes me so mad. <laughs> Noom, Noom is based on science. They've, in fact, they've published more than 30 peer-reviewed scientific articles aimed at practitioners, scientists, the public, and your users, their users, of course, about how they work 
what their methods are. You know, it used to be I'd come home from a day of work and I'd stuff my face. And I wasn't even aware of it. I helped Noom help me understand that, help me think about it, help me understand why I did it. It wasn't stop doing that. I don't have to lock food away in a lockbox. <laughs> uh, it wasn't at all that. He says, go ahead and eat that, but understand what's going on. And then just a few simple things that I slowly learned over time, and uh, that behavior dis disappeared. I used to be a big snacker, you know, late at night, late at night snacker. Haven't done that in, in months, years, I guess, since I've been doing it for about a year and a half. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom Weight's psychological-based approach. Sign up for your trial at noom.com slash twit. Now, when you go there, you're going to answer a lot of questions. And if, uh, uh, the first time I thought, well, this is a lot of questions, but that's so they can tailor. This is very tailored to you and what you need. So do answer those questions. You know, give them all the information. Be honest. Uh, it really, really works. It really, really helps. N double O M noom dot com slash twit. Um, do 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 that though, because I think if you if you like me, I've been on every day. You know, some of you know how many diets I've been on. Every diet in the world. And yeah, some of them worked, but I didn't feel healthy. This one is great. Um, uh, we're having a soup and salad tonight, thanks to Lisa. It's good if you can get your partner to do it, too. It really is. Noom.com slash twit. Sign up for your trial today. I asked her, I chatted her. I said, can I can I use you uh, in the in the Noom ad? He said, yeah, sure. And he said I could use his name, but I'm not going to use his name. But 60 pounds, and I did not recognize him. He looks great. Noom.com slash twit. Now back to the tech guy. A geek on the radio. He calls himself Leo the tech guy, and he's going to take another call. Ken is on the line from Talmadge, Ohio. Hello, Ken. Hello, Leo. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. And this is, uh, this is one of the uh, uh, things I've been waiting to do for a long time, uh, give you a call uh, concerning Linux, I'm a Linux user. I've used Windows as well, but uh, right now I use a Linux, MX Linux 19, and uh, I'm very, very happy with it. And I've wondered if you could uh, talk or elaborate a little bit about uh, whether it's secure enough to use for a banking business or stockbroker account, that sort of thing. Uh, Security-wise. I would say absolutely. So let me uh, tell people what Linux is. I think probably if you listen to this show, you've heard the name. Uh, there are two main commercial operating systems. Actually, I really should say there are four commercial operating systems. Windows, Mac OS, iOS, which is Apple's iPhone and iPad operating system, and uh, Android. Those are commercial. They're, they're owned by companies, although Android is at root. Uh, open source based on Linux, of all things, which makes Linux the most used operating system in the world because it's a free open, free as in not no cost necessarily, but free as in liberated open source operating system. That is very good. It is as good as Mac OS. I'd say it's better than Windows. Uh, not developed by one man or one company, but by thousands who contribute and work on it, as, as is the case with open source projects. And so as a result, I think Linux has matured over time. To, it's become easier to use. It does almost everything Windows does. And in fact, you can run many Windows programs on Linux using compatibility layers like Wine and Proton. So Linux is, I think, increasingly a very good choice for desktop users. Certainly, when you go on the web, more than half of the websites you visit are running on some form of Unix, either either BSD or Linux. Uh, you, so you're using it every day, all the time. If you have an Android phone, you're using it. So is it secure? You know, it's kind of, no operating system is perfect. All operating systems have flaws. Linux absolutely has flaws. There have been some very well-known, highly publicized flaws in programs that people use on Linux, like OpenSSH. But because it's open source, in my opinion, more people are looking at it, uh, working on it, and trying to fix it. And patches come out very rapidly. You know, if you tell, and this has happened, if you tell Apple, hey, there's a flaw in your software, it's uh, making its your users vulnerable, Apple can decide not to fix it. They did for a long time with a very important flaw. 
Or Apple can say, yeah, we better fix it, as they just did. They just updated iOS, iPadOS, and macOS all at once because there was a massive zero-day flaw. So bad things happen to all operating systems. The question really is, how easy is it to get it fixed? And I would say Linux is right up there, probably superior in some ways to the commercial operating systems. Now, you do want to choose a secure Linux. You use MX Linux, which I've never used. Do you like it? Oh, very much. Yeah. I, uh I, I started out years ago with Lindos. Uh, yeah, this was this then, was an attempt to make a, a Windows compatible Linux or comparable Linux. Uh, they kind of yeah. drifted off. It was under the aegis of a guy who kind of lost interest. But uh, which 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 now the other thing about Linux is great is choice. So with uh, MX Linux and many others, you have a choice of desktop environment. Which one do you like? Well, I have it on both. I use it on desktop, and I have a couple of. Uh, uh, laptops that it's also installed on, and I've not found a computer yet that it won't yeah. load up and run. This it's particular true. Yeah. version, I don't know if they're all like that, but this MX Linux 19, uh, I know it's not the latest, but it works. It makes every everything I've got work fine. That's the other thing about Linux, because it's free and open source. Many, many people have said, I'm going to make my version. And so you're choosing, you can choose from, they call them distributions or distros for short. And you could choose from hundreds of distros. Uh, if you go to distrowatch.org, you can see some of the more popular ones. Uh, I use uh, a, a distro called Manjaro. Uh, recommend Pop! OS for a lot of people. But there is a huge variety. And underneath it's always the Linux kernel, which is, I think, f fundamentally very secure and always is getting updated. Um, so your kernel is very secure. Not necessary, and then on top of the kernel, of course, like as with any operating system, you install applications, and some of them are less secure than others. So, it's one thing that's required of all computer users is you keep up to date, you pay attention to updates. Uh, I think Linux has a very good update story. Uh, any any version, modern version of Linux will notify you when there's updates. There may be updates almost daily because you have a lot of different programs running. But if you apply those, I think you're as secure, if not more secure. Certainly secure enough to do anything you're going to do on Windows or Mac. Yeah, yes, this uh, this Linux uh, that I use, uh, it updates when and it, it'll show you that you need an update. Yep. It'll notify you, yep. and you can take a deep breath and click update, <laughs> and it's done by the time you need to take another breath. That's the other thing I love. You know, Windows is constantly saying, "Okay, you're gonna have to restart. You're gonna restart. Over, do it overnight. Do it now. We're gonna restart." We had this problem yesterday. Kim's computer restarted right before the beginning of the show. We weren't sure if she, we had to come up with a backup plan because Windows had decided, "Well, it's time to time to update." Uh, Linux will never do that to you. You do sometimes need to restart. If the kernel gets updated, you have to restart, which is monthly maybe. But uh, you don't have to, and you can do it whenever you feel like it. They'll just put a little notice up saying, yeah, you want to, uh, you know, if you want all of these updates to work now, you can continue to run Linux as you are, but if you want the new kernel, you'll have to restart. Uh, I think it's a very, I think it's the, honestly, uh, every time I buy a Windows machine, it's just the clock starts. It's only a matter of time before I throw my hands up and <laughs> say, all right, I'm going to put Linux on it. <laughs> I just give up often. Um, so there you have it. There you have it. Um, I, I agree with you. Yeah. On the uh, on Linux, uh, are you uh, confident in that uh, Clam TK uh, virus scanner? And is it is it enough? Uh, well, here's the th funny thing about Clam <laughs> is it's essentially scanning for Windows viruses. <laughs> Not for, oh. <laughs> because as a computer user, you have to be very careful about these Windows guys. There's so many viruses out there. So if you send an attachment or you send somebody a file, you really want to make sure it's 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 not harmful to you on Linux, but you want to make sure it's not going to harm them. And that's mostly what Clam is uh, is used for to check for uh, uh, Windows viruses. There are not a lot of Linux viruses, and they are almost always patched immediately. Partly that's because if you're a bad guy. And you have a choice between going after a billion and a half computers or, you know, a hundred million computers. You're going to go after the billion, right? So most viruses are written for Windows. Uh, a, because there are many places you can attack it. And B, because that's where the money is. You know, you rob banks because that's where the money is. So Linux, by virtue to some degree of its obscurity, also benefits. Also benefits. Yeah, but Clam is good. I, there's no reason not to use Clam. 
Uh, I don't. Um, if you if you are sending attachments and files to Windows users, you probably should use Clam. Um, you know, Clam TK is the graphic interface version of the Clam antivirus tool. So uh, TK just means it's a GUI as opposed to command line. That's the one thing perhaps that stops people from using uh, Linux is it's it, it, it does, a lot of the tools are command line, you know, like the DOS prompt as opposed to graphical. But you can live in the graphics uh, environment if you if you don't want to hit the command line. I think it's, I think, I like the command line myself. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you, I would not, remember antivirus, all of this antivirus stuff is really aimed at Windows users. And they don't do anything really on mobile devices. There is some usefulness on Mac OS because there are viruses out there as Mac OS gets more and more use. But honestly, anti the whole antivirus virus industry is, is designed for people who use Windows. Linux, you don't have to worry. Does that make sense? <laughs> does, that, does that reassure you? Go ahead. Go forth and use Linux with pride. Thanks. I do. <laughs> Yay. Thank you much for the call. Thank um, you for the call, Ken. Have a great one. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And I've just irritated 99% of our audience. Just pissed off at me now. All right, Sam, you better reassure them. This is not a communist conspiracy. <laughs> No, not not by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> First EVs, no, uh, then Linux. What is this world coming to? Well, you know, most of those EVs are running Linux. I know. So I know. Is it? Yeah. Is that actually? That's interesting. So it's not. Uh, it's not other RTOSs like Windows, uh, Microsoft's car, uh, they, or they, 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 Android, most of them or, are actually running a variety of OSs. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's usually most cars have some Linux in them somewhere. Uh, there's often some QNX. Um, there's um, Green Hills software right. uh, does a, as a, as a real time OS. There's there's several others. Interestingly, um, next year, uh, GM is going to start launching some cars with their new Altify software platform, uh, which you can think of it kind of the way that um, Android is structured, the way Android is architected. So Android <clears throat> has Linux underneath. There's a Linux kernel, and then there's this Android layer that has all the APIs in there and, you know, developers, you know, write uh, their apps, you know, calling those APIs to get access to signals, sensor signals and data and things like that. Uh, and to and to do things, they go through those APIs. Well, Altify is going to be a similar kind of structure for GM as they move to a more centralized compute architecture um, where you'll have this middleware layer that is similar to the Android layer on a phone or other device. And then, the the functions that currently run in individual electronic control units scattered around the car are going to be moved onto this. They're going to be rewritten, moved onto that, so that instead of having an ECU separate for your electronic stability control system, they'll just take that and move that onto Altify and port it to that platform, and then it will get the, the signals from the various sensors through the Altify layer and send the commands back to the actuators through Altify. And Altify is going to be running on top of Red Hat Linux. Oh, Red interesting. Hat is doing an, an huh. automotive Linux. Huh. Um, so that's going to be the core operating system for GM vehicles starting next year. Um, so, you know, there's there's a, a lot of different OSs out there. Um, and But Linux is an increasingly important one in EVs uh, as well as other cars. Interesting. Um, but to address one of the things that's been going on here in, in the chat about the grid and you know how uh, you know how how that's going to be handled as i mentioned um in the in the last break i think you know, there are there's enough power generating capacity in the us to support our needs that's not the issue the issue we have is the distribution the grid that gets the power from power stations from dams from um, solar farms wind farms nuclear plants to the end users um, that's what has not necessarily kept up uh, and in some places it's worse than others Texas has a problem because they decided that they didn't want to be part of the national grid and and be able to transmit power in and out of Texas you know if they if they have a problem you know locally they didn't want to be able to get power from Oklahoma or Arkansas um, and you know they're gonna have to deal with that problem 
But <clears throat> what was also mentioned was uh, in California, for example, uh, where there have been a lot of problems over the last, particularly over the last decade, with um, uh, not you know with rolling blackouts. You know when they have periods of of peak demand. You know when it gets very hot and you have, especially in the middle of the day, you have your peak power demand, uh, and the system can't keep up. The grid can't keep up with sending that power. And in some cases that has led to power lines and transformers going down and causing fires, which just makes the problem worse. Um, and so, uh, PG and E, which is your local utility there, uh, um, Leo, um, they are doing a test program right now with general motors and with Ford. Uh, and it's a pilot right now, but they'll pro by the end of the year, they're going to, they're doing it. They're doing lab testing right now. By the end of the year, they're going to start inviting customers in to participate in this uh, using uh, what's known as uh, a demand response system with bi directional charging. So we've talked previously about the F 150 Lightning, uh, which has a home power backup capability. It's got bi directional charging. So you can put power in, you can, when you plug in an F 150 Lightning, you can put power into it to charge the battery. Or when you need that power, you can take it back out again. And the uh, the Hyundai Ionic 5 and Kia EV6 also have this vehicle to load capability to take power out, uh, not at, not at as high a level as the, the Ford, but uh, but they're doing this. GM is going to be adding this into their EVs, and um, the the Ford system, the way it works is it's all currently it's all controlled locally. So if you get a Lightning and you get the home integration kit, if it detects your power going out to your home. It flips the transfer switch to disconnect your home from the grid and automatically starts pulling power from the battery in your truck down to a certain level. You can set a minimum threshold. And I think it defaults to about 30%. Uh, so you can have enough power to go somewhere else and charge it up if you need to. Um, and, you know, but, uh, you know, with the the typical amount of power consumption in a, in a typical American home, uh, which is, uh, uh, what do I, want to say? I think it's like uh, less it's enough. Uh, it's enough that you can power a typical American home without shutting anything off for about three days. Um, and if you start turning off unessential things, you can go up to ten days off the light battery and the lightning. Uh, what they're what PG and E is doing with GM and Ford is they're testing controlling this remotely, so that for customers that opt in, um, if PG and E detects that their demand is getting up close to the limits of what they can transmit. Uh, then what they can do is send a signal out to vehicles that are plugged in and have them automatically switch, switch and take those houses temporarily off the grid for an hour or two and power those homes off the EV that's plugged in. Uh, and then what that does is it brings down the load, brings down the demand on the grid so that they can keep up. And they can actually avoid, potentially avoid these rolling blackouts and brownouts. Um, and then as the demand level goes down again, then they can bring those those homes back online and, and charge those vehicles back up again. So this is one of the potential ways that they're looking at. There's a lot of a lot of potential solutions uh, to this. Um, you know, obviously more major overhaul of the grid is a key component of this as well. And that's something that we're going to be seeing a lot more of over the next several years. And and some of that, the uh, the infrastructure bill that was passed uh, earlier this year includes some funding to support that. Uh, so I think, you know, that, and also when you look at the, the number of EVs that we're going to have on the road in the next decade, uh, I was mentioning something in the, in the chat about this, you know, we have, uh, I was just looking at the, uh, at a, a database the other day, there's currently over 290 million registered vehicles in the United States. When, you know, even in a good year, when we don't have supply chain problems, we've never sold more than about 17 and a half million new vehicles a year. So at 17 million vehicles a year to replace the entire vehicle fleet is going to take several decades. You know, it's going to be a long time before we don't have any gas vehicles left on the road. Um, you know, we first, you know, we don't have enough capacity to build batteries and we don't have the materials to build the batteries, you know, to turn them over that much faster. And, you know, frankly, people cannot afford to buy 
all new vehicles, you know, in the next 10 years. So even with the four, you know, at my company, um, Guidehouse Insights, where we do, one of the things we do is forecasting of demand for technologies. You know, our, our forecast is, you know, in 2030, um, you know, about 34, 35% of new vehicles sold are going to be EVs. It might be a little higher than that. But even, even at that, by 2030, less than 10% of the vehicles on the road in the U.S. will be electric. So it's not going to be, you know, that big of a load. We, we actually have some time to make these grid upgrades. And in combination with doing things like uh, demand response and bi-directional charging, um, you know, I think we, we should be fine, you know, in terms of uh, being able to support the number of EVs that are actually going to be built and sold in that time frame. Mr. Okay. Sam Abul Samad, well spoken. Well done. I just don't want any I just don't want people to panic. Don't panic. Have a great week. Uh you will, too. I will see you next time. See ya. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye bye. Well, hey, 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 how are you today, Leo Laporte here? Yes, I'm your tech guy, a geek on the radio. My gosh, who thought that was a good idea? Well, <laughs> You really want to know? <laughs> I know I can name names, uh, but thank them. I thank them profusely. Uh, the people at uh, KFI who first put me on the air, Robin Bertolucci and company, and uh, and the people at the Premier Radio Network who, for some reason, I just don't know why, think this is a good idea. And I am not going to look a gift radio show in the mouth. No siree. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. Uh, if you're listening, I guess you probably think it's a good idea too, or you just can't believe it. And it's like, oh, really? A four, a four legged, uh, kitty cat. Oh, I've got to see that. 8888 Ask Leo. I guess that's not too unusual. Uh, that's the phone number anywhere in the U S or Canada outside that area. You can use Skype out, something like that. Call 8888 Ask Leo, uh, the website. And I mention this because, uh, you know, you're listening, you're thinking, oh, Oh, that, that might be useful. I should remember that. Maybe worse, you're driving and you pull out a pad and paper. No, stop. Uh, we'll put it all down there for you on the website. And it's free and there's no charge. And you just wander on in and get that information. It's techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. Uh, and uh, we put links up there. Uh, eventually, there'll be a transcript of the show with time codes. There'll be an uh, audio of the show and video of the show. So uh, everything's there and uh, and you can find what you want. In fact, on Sundays, we even put uh, our musical director, Professor Laura's uh, playlist up there so you can get all the songs that she's played in the interstitial music. TechGuyLabs.com. This is episode 1920. Hey, we're in the Roaring Twenties. Let's see. Do you think we'll ever make it to the year 2000? <laughs> It's only 80 more shows. I'm going to guess yes. I'm going to guess maybe. Back to the phones we go. Dan on the line. New York. New York. Hello, Dan. Hello, Leo. Love the show. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Welcome. Thanks, thanks. So uh, here's the deal. I'm a comedian in New York. Nice. And That's exciting. And, uh, stand Stand-up yeah. comic? Stand-up comic, mostly serving the Indian community. And Indian as in East Indian or West Indian? As in Native Americans? <laughs> the true Indians. Indian, Indian. The, yeah. the East Indians, okay. Right, right. And so uh, I have um, made friends with an a, a actress in India, a Bollywood actress, who's sort of a big wig, and I'm a small wig or medium at most. And uh, we want to do a podcast together. Oh. She's in yeah, she's in India and I'm in New York. And I'm wondering what hardware we should get. Totally in. doable. Uh, I've, really? I've, because I don't know if you know, we have a podcast network, a uh, couple of dozen shows. Many of our guests, hosts are anywhere in the world. In fact, a little later on, uh, we'll talk to Chris Marquardt from Germany. You'd never know. Uh, I have, mm -hmm. uh, we have guest hosts in Asia, all over the world. So that's not a problem. Uh, we used to use Skype for that, Skype, either audio or video. But of late, we found Zoom is easily the best quality audio and video. And Zoom makes it very easy for you to 
record this. You can even record a Zoom call uh, with separate channels for each caller. So if she starts coughing while you're talking, you can just cut that out or vice versa. <laughs> So, yeah, this is not going to be live. It's going to be recorded. Yeah, so you can you record it on Zoom, but you can then edit it uh, for uh, putting it out as a podcast. Easy to do. Oh, and anything you could you would do Zoom with, you can do it with. I mean, obviously, you can improve the cameras and improve the microphones over your laptop camera and mic. Uh, but that's kind of all up to you. Um, if you, in my opinion, if you want to go out and get the best podcasting microphone, sure makes it. It's the MV7. Okay. Based on a, it's not cheap, two hundred sixty nine bucks, but it plugs right into your computer, and it's based on the very famous SM7B that most radio stations use. Uh, so each, each of you could have that. That would give you very good audio going into the computer, and then if you wanted to get a better camera, frankly, uh, you can use your smartphone as a camera. I uh, my the best cam I've tried them all. The best camera I have at home is my iPhone connected to my Mac with a, a program called Camo, C-A-M-O. But there, but you can use Android phones as well, and there are various programs to make it possible. Are you on Windows or Mac? Uh, I'm on Windows. She's on Mac. Okay. And, but we're going to be audio only. Oh, then that's easy. Then that's easy. And honestly, you don't need to go... I mean, the, the MV7 is the kind of the, um, you know, <laughs> state of the art. So you don't need to go that far. Uh, but I have to say, one thing I have noticed, the better the microphone, the better, the better the sound, rather, the, the better your podcast. Uh, you think the audience will be primarily in India? Uh, it'll be, well, my audience is Indians in America, and her audience is millions, uh, or maybe even tens of millions in India. So nice. It's sort of like going to be a hybrid, yeah. Nice. And, and do, can song. you do it in English, or do you have to do it in Hindi, or... Uh... No, it's, it's going to be all in English. In English. In India, Everybody speaks English. I've done a lot of, yeah. Yeah, I've done a lot of shows in India, and, and, and you know, it's all, I've always performed in English, yes. There are so, there's so many languages in India. Uh, yeah, a, yeah. Any language you chose would, in a, in a way, kind of say, oh, you know, you can't listen to this, you know. If, you, if, you, if you're Hindi, you can't listen to Bengali. If you're, well, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. If you're Marathi, well, you better not listen to it in Bodo, and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so uh, I understand that. English is probably the easiest uh, to do. That's, that's exciting. That's very exciting. Yeah, I think you've got to – you'll do well. And, and, you know, because of the popularity of Bollywood, not just in India but worldwide, I yeah. th don't tell anybody, but I think you have a good shot at selling this at some point to one of the big podcast networks. You know, what the trend in podcasting, whether it's iHeart or Spotify or any of the other big companies now who are very big in podcasts, is celebrities. They love a celebrity podcast because they come with a built-in audience. So right. if your co-host is one of the most popular Bollywood stars, you're going to get approached pretty quickly. And I'll tell you why that's a good thing. There's a bad thing and it's a good thing. It's a good thing because... It's very hard as an independent podcast to sell advertising, to make any money at it. If you don't care about money, if it's just for your own fun, that's fun, that's the best. But it, most of the time, people want to make a little money on it, at least to cover expenses. Selling advertising nowadays is very tough because of Spotify and iHeart and all these other big companies who are eating it up, eating up all the advertising in the podcast industry. So it's really nice to be picked up by somebody big who can help you with that part of it. Cool. Has anyone offered you, or have you already been picked up? Or? No. <laughs> no, and I'll tell you why. First of all, no celebrities. If we had a Bollywood star on here, man, it'd be easy. But mostly it's because people still to this day go, oh, technology, that's such a niche. Nobody, you know, so if you look at the podcasts that are being picked up, the Joe Rogans, the Call Her Daddies, the Ringer, uh, these are these are much more general interest podcasts. They're talking about men's issues, women's issues, and sports. <laughs> uh, well, I love I love listening to your podcast. I listen Thank you, to the gym because my mind used to go crazy. Just you know, and now I listen to you at the gym. It's weird to hear you talk so so slowly. Like, oh, you listen at high speed, I, so you think I'm drunk I, right now? Is what happens? Yeah, I listen to I listen to triple speed. Oh my gosh! So I'm talking like this, and 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 and, and then now you hear me, and I sound like I'm a little bit tipsy. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm not tipsy. Well, I assure you. 
<laughs> when someone speaks as clearly as you do, it's really easy to listen to double, and then you can get up to triple. Oh, easy. Lord. I'm going to have to start slurring my words, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good luck. Uh, call us back, Dan, when you launch it. Thank you. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to promote it. Uh, that sounds so much fun. And what is the subject going to be? Um, well, we're going to you know, talk about what it's like to be in entertainment in, in, in community. And then Perfect. we want to get, you know, we want to get like celebrities to come sure. on, like you know, Satya Nadella. It's only the second largest population in the world. I think you might find an audience. <laughs> and it's the largest English speaking audience. Exactly. Well. Yeah. You couldn't so. do better. I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> what do you have a name for it yet? Oh, not this yet. No. All not right. Yet. Well, call me back when you do. We'll give it a big plug. Thank you so much. Good luck, Dan. That's exciting. I think that's a great idea. Ah. Start me up. That was how many people remember what that was the theme song for? Obviously, it's the Rolling Stones. Do you remember? Windows 95. Remember that? That was the theme. How much do you think they had to pay Mick and company? for uh, <laughs> the Windows 95 to make Start Me Up, the Windows 95 jingle. Whoosh. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, 888-827-5536. We're talking high tech. Me and Doug from Murrieta, California. Hello, Doug. Hey, Leo. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? Uh, it's hot down here. Yes, Yes, that's why I've locked myself in an air-conditioned room. <laughs> Trying to survive. I shall not emerge yeah, to the sun. That fireball in the sky goes away. Go away. <laughs> what can I do for you? Uh, well, a security question. I've been a victim of identity theft uh, uh, several times in the last couple, three years. Several times? Oh, yeah, no. That shouldn't happen to anybody even once. Oh. I mean understand and i'm super careful super careful i listen to you so that makes me even more careful and how do you know how that happened uh, no not really it's there's all sorts of ways it can happen of course people can go through your trash that's actually one of the most common ways i don't know about you but i get uh, credit card solicitations at least weekly and all it takes is one of those uh, and somebody can I, poses you right and, and i shred all of those so, Good man, you are careful. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, yeah. online there's always a risk that uh, your credentials could be show up in a breach. You know, companies are root often these days. I don't. Even, it's happened so often. I don't even report it anymore. Uh, broken into by bad guys who then get access to your credentials uh, to steal your identity. Usually, they would need. Well, it depends what you mean by identity theft. Typically, what I'd mean is somebody assuming your identity. Uh, and getting credit cards uh, in your name and starting to buy stuff. And, of course, they have no intent of paying off those credit cards, so it ends up being a black mark on your credit report. Uh, to get a credit card, usually you need a Social Security number, a birth date. Uh, sometimes you need additional documentation. But if they can get that information, man, you're really at risk. Well, that's exactly what's happened. And originally we, we think it was a family member who sold that information on that. Oh, nice. Oh, that's yeah. great. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. That is the worst. How low can you go? But more recently, and, and here's my, my tech question. Um, I, I'm concerned about a, a man in the middle attack. And, I, and I'm asking your expertise. I, you know, set up a separate uh, router uh, on my system, so I'm the only one going through the router. Uh, I set up a VPN. Well, you uh, really are cautious. I guess once burned, twice shy. Is there any way anybody could do a men in the middle attack? If they're between me and the, uh, uh, I, you know, where the ISP connects yeah. to the internet. So first, let me explain for those listening what he means. Uh, if you think about it, you know, if you have a, let's say you've got a transaction with your bank, you're talking to your bank, you say, uh, I want to, you know, send some money. Uh, that's just between you and the bank. It's a two person conversation. What if somebody could get in between and intercept the traffic in both directions? Then that'd be a major security breach. That's called a man in the middle. Get it? Third party in between those two parties. 
And there are lots of ways you can do a man in the middle. Uh, for instance, uh, in messaging apps, and this uh, nation states and others do this, in messaging apps, they might create, without your knowledge or even being able to see it, a group that looks like it's a two-person conversation, but they're in the group. Uh, un, un, unnoticed, uh, unobserved, but they see all the traffic. That's a very common man in the middle. Uh, man, you're talking about a man in the middle over the Internet. That's a lot harder to do. Uh, to intercept your traffic, especially if it's HTTPS secured traffic, which almost all traffic is nowadays, certainly all financial traffic is, it's very hard to get in the middle of that. Uh, yes, if, you're, if your router, for instance, has a security flaw and they can get into your router, they can live there and be a man in the middle. But once it exits your router on the way to the bank, going over the public internet, uh, if it's encrypted, it's very hard to get in the middle. You know, one of the ways the, uh, the uh, federal government got in the middle, you know, your, your data is encrypted on your phone, but the, they got it in transit, right? So that's, that's kind of a man in the middle, right? Uh, in transit via either via breaking into your ISP. There was a whistleblower uh, from AT&T who said, yeah, the federal government has a, a room in San Francisco at AT&T. If you're an, not AT&T or phone, but if you're an AT&T internet customer, they're intercepting all traffic. Boy, we were, we were shocked when we learned this some years ago. Um, so th all of that can happen. That's not going to cause identity theft, though, because they're not the government's not bad. Well, they're bad guys, but not, not, they're not going to steal money from you. Uh, they have they have means to do that called the IRS. They don't need to do it in any other way. Um, so you make sure your router is secure. Absolutely, make sure there's another way to do it. Would if if I were able to get a Trojan horse on your computer, I could observe everything you're doing. Uh, that's something, by the way, that people try all the time. You've we've heard about those calls. Hello, this is Windows. You've got a mm -hmm. bug. We want to fix it. Just give us control of your computer. And you do, they, you do, you go, oh, my God, what's going on? And what is the first thing they do? They put a remote access Trojan on your computer so they can, from then on, see everything you're doing. Uh, but you sound like you're extremely cautious. You're doing your security updates. You're patching your router, your operating system, all the apps. I don't think that's the whole Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's, uh, let's continue down this road, though. I'm curious what else could be going on. You know, like at a well, use a coffee shop as an as an analogy, uh, and that's why we say use a VPN. So, but a coffee shop, even now, even these days, is much less dangerous than it used to be. Okay, if there's somebody between my router and the 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 entry point, the the POI POE of of where the internet comes into the property. Can oh yeah, person... sure, they could put a listening device there, but again. If your tra traffic is encrypted by, and, and that means going to a secure website, which is everywhere, right? You go to Amazon, your bank, everywhere these days, Facebook, everywhere is HTTPS. By the time it exits your computer, it's encrypted and cannot be read. And does the VPN increase that encryption? Not really. It's the same. It's just putting an encryption within encryption. So okay. a VPN is of less use these days because so much traffic is encrypted. Not all traffic. Used to be, I mean, this used to be an easy thing to do. You'd go to a coffee shop, and your and your email password is flying through the air unencrypted. Boy, that's a terrible attack. But nowadays, no email system is unencrypted. They're all HTTPS. Mm. But a VPN, that's the idea of a VPN, is if there is unencrypted traffic, we're going to encrypt the entire tunnel. There is a risk with a VPN, because unless you choose a good provider, they see it unencrypted. They see what you would see if you were at a coffee shop without a VPN. Now, again, that's right. less less of a problem these days because everything's HTTPS. Yeah. So I then, so so you the one time you got hacked. Well, okay, you had a you had a you know evil family member. Yeah. You don't know how you got atta got a, a attacked the other times though. Not really. Um, it's it's. I don't know. The, where I get my internet from right now, we live on a property with a with a property owner. Yeah, and so stuff's going through him. He could, in theory, look at it. Again, 
When you go to your bank, look, it should say HTTPS. And, and you know, if you're really paranoid, look at the certificate and make sure the certificate is owned by that company, the bank. He can't do anything with it. It's just not okay. usable. Mm. All right. Well, that makes me feel better. I, I am using a VPN. I was just wondering if a tour... Using Tor, with no Tor. So Tor is an anonymizing tool, not a security tool. So oh, okay. Tor, which means you go through multiple servers, does have a massive flaw, which is if anybody owns the exit server, you're screwed. And lots of government agencies, including our own, have been buying up and setting up Tor exit servers because they know, oh yeah, well somebody's up to no good, so let's own the exit server. So they see all that traffic. Again, you're protected if the traffic is encrypted, and that's really the key. And that's why Google pushed so hard for something called HTTPS everywhere. And now it is, pretty much. Uh, I think most sites, if in fact, you'll get a warning these days if you go to a site that's not HTTPS. So that's protecting you. That means from your computer to theirs, it's encrypted. Even a man in the middle is just going to see a bunch of garbage. Okay. So I think you're, right. I no, think you're pretty you good. Better. Yeah, I think you you know, you're clearly savvy about all this. Tor is not honestly a very useful thing anymore. Uh, VPN is only useful for unencrypted traffic. There's not a lot of that anymore. Um, you know, I if you're on a hotel internet or a cruise ship or a coffee shop, you know, a public internet, sure use a VPN, why not? Um, but choose wisely cuz a VPN now is is like your neighbor. <laughs> Well, I'm using ExpressVPN, which I Good man. Think used to be. A, Good man. Used to be one of your. That's still a sponsor. Uh, yep. Sponsor. Yeah. yeah, and I trust them. They were acquired recently, and people have been worried a little bit by the company that acquired them. But I have done a lot of digging and talked to them, and I'm satisfied that they continue to do everything right. Okay. Well, I'll let you go. One quick question. Yeah. Are you allowing visitors? Uh, not yet. Studio. Not yet. Not with uh, the latest <laughs> variants. <laughs> I'll let you know, though. I'd love to meet you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. I'm sorry, Doug. Take care. Everybody loves Mambo. Mambo's the best. And I'm not talking Mamba. Not Mamba Snake. Mambo, the dance. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. Normally, Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, would be joining us. He's away again this week. He'll be back next week. Chris is scouting, and I'm really happy to hear this, his next photo trip. So he's going out, he's driving around, scouting sh places, locations for his next photo trip. He stopped, you know, during COVID, he stopped doing the photo workshops, Travel used to travel all over the world to do that. I'm glad to hear he's getting back on the on the horse, because uh, I'm going to do the next one. <laughs> 8888, ask Leah. Let's continue on with the show. Ben's on the line from Los Angeles. Hi, Ben. Hi, uh, Leo. Uh, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, so, how are you doing today? First I am all, great. How are you? I'm good. Good. So, first of all, I'm going back to school for AutoCAD. Awesome. I have... We had, you know, yesterday I got a call from a guy. He's an architect. He's been an architect for decades, using AutoCAD since the earliest days. He loves it. What are you thinking about doing? Uh, so for civil engineers, making maps. Perfect. Wonderful. Yes. So, uh, my mind's like a three-part question. A, which computer should I use? Should I use a, a, a Microsoft or a, a, a Office or a MacBook? And if if it works with a MacBook, I have a 2019 MacBook Pro. Is there any software for that? Mm. So uh, most people use AutoCAD, I'm sad to say, use Windows. But the good news is Auto, Autodesk, the makers of AutoCAD, <clears throat> do make it for Mac OS. In fact, they even make it for uh, M1 as well as for the Intel. Yours is an Intel Mac. Uh, probably be great. Uh, you know, uh, you, you're not going to have too much trouble. Wait a minute. Let me see. Autodesk. Let me just make sure. 3D modeling, CAD rendering, animation, VFX, and digital imagery. So the one thing you should check, and you could do it at the Autodesk site, you're going to be using a specific part of AutoCAD 
that is for civil engineering. I would make sure that that tool set, they have a bunch of different tool sets, is Mac capable. I'm sure it is. But ask your teachers or ask the school, which tool sets, those are the add-ons to AutoCAD, which tool set do I need to use for my classes? Okay. And the other thing is ask them about student pricing because AutoCAD is almost two thousand dollars a year. You probably, you probably want to get the student pricing. I'm sure they have it because they really want to get you hooked <laughs> as a student, so that you'll be using it in your work life forever and ever and ever. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So almost all these companies offer very good student pricing, but you'll have to get that probably through the school. Okay. And then I would ask the school because uh, they may even have laptop recommendations. But your old MacBook is fine. That's going to be fine. As I told the guy yesterday, the difference is not whether it works or not works. The difference is how much time it takes to do what you want to do. And sometimes you're going to get up and get a cup of coffee while it's rendering your design or whatever. That's, that's normal. You, what you're paying for when you get a much more expensive computer is just speed. Not It works. It works. It's just slower. Yeah, no, I understand that because uh, the problem is uh, I'm on a limited budget and I, I, I got my MacBook from work. I work for Home Depot. Nice. So they, they offered uh, pricing for, for, for employees. So Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, are, are you go the school should help you with this stuff. Right. So call them. Maybe the you know sometimes it's the bursar, sometimes it's the university bookstore, but find out who you know. Do you guys have sell computers? Do you sell AutoCAD? Do you you know tell me what tell me what I need for the classes? You might even want to talk to uh, a professor in that department and say what do you recommend? It's not so much what the tech guy recommends; it's what they recommend because they know what software you're going to be using and so forth. There are I should mention there are free uh, CAD programs out there, open source CAD programs out there that are compatible with AutoCAD that will run AutoCAD files and so forth. Um, but that doesn't matter if the school says, no, no, you need AutoCAD. <laughs> so that's why you have to talk to the school. You have to say, well, what do I need? Uh, you know, and if they say, well, you can use Tinkercad. It's free. You can use that. Oh, Nice or SketchUp, or whatever, you can use that. Uh, okay, good. But you need to ask them. Uh, AutoCAD is is uh, pretty pricey. <laughs> uh, they have a light version. Uh, they do have a student uh, uh, package and so forth. Probably to do it through the, the student package, you probably need to do it through the school. But if you go to, I'll put a link to their education page at autodesk.com. If you go there, you'll get a you'll get an idea of what they offer. And uh, and then call the school. That's true for any student. I, a lot of times, parents, you know, we're getting to that time of year where you're going to be going off to school. Your your kid is going to college uh, or going to technical school, and parents call and say, "What should we get them?" Always a good idea to call the school. They may have discounts that you can't get at regular stores. They certainly have the knowledge of what you might need. It'll save you a lot of time. Hey, good luck, Ben. That's exciting. Oh, real one last question. Sure. Uh, um, so the programs, are they transferable? Like if I use a Mac and they need it to be put on a, a, a office, uh, like a Windows, is that, is, are those Usually, programs, I don't uh, know off the top of my head if AutoCAD is. Uh, AutoCAD is a pretty high, used to be at least a pretty highly protected program. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of copy protection. Um, you should be able to check on the site, can I use a Mac serial number on Windows? Uh, I'm sure you okay. can. Certainly the files are. Uh, I would expect that what you could, you know, when you buy a license, usually it licenses it for one or two machines. Uh, the, the, your question is appropriate. Does, does a license on, if I activate it on a Mac, can I still use it uh, to activate it on a, on a Windows machine? Is my second machine. And then the other question is, if I don't use this machine, can I deactivate it? Usually you can and move it to another machine. Almost always you can do that. Okay, good. But, but you have to... Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'll have to ask them. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Yeah, but I, yeah. Thank you very much. And, oh, the educational version of AutoCAD is free. Yay! So that'll eliminate all of these licensing issues. That's nice. And we have uh, a number of people in the chat room saying, 
No problem. You can uh, use it on Mac and PC. And, of course, the free version you're not going to have any trouble with. Okay. Thank That's great. So good news. Hey, good luck. Are you Thank excited? You. I'm very excited. Uh, a career change. Yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah. yeah. But now you can uh, wear a tie to work. It'll be great. I work from home. You can work from home even better. You don't have to wear anything. Yeah. <laughs> I think work from home is the best thing ever. Awesome. Well, yeah. congratulations, and, and and good on you for having the uh, initiative to say I'm gonna I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna take take some charge of my life here. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Good luck to you. That's awesome. <laughs> well, you have to wear some clothes. I mean, <laughs> just uh, you know. Just please wear pants at least, okay? Just for me. <laughs> 8888, uh, ask Leo the phone number. Um, there is a lot of talk in the chat room about uh, free stuff, but I have to say, if AutoCAD for students is free, that's, you know, that's the creme de la creme. That's probably used more often in business than anywhere or anything. Highly recommend it. You learn that. If you learn AutoCAD, you're it's a, you're ready to you know use any tool. Gumby in our chat room says, "Please always wear business casual when work from home. You'll never know when <laughs> when the Zoom will ring." That's true. That's true. I just keep a shirt on the chair. <laughs> I can pull it on, and uh, just make sure you don't stand up. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Techguylabs.com. Where if your calls right after this. I literally do keep a shirt handy, <laughs> just in case. You never know. <laughs> so uh, F10, and then I can uh, change what's in the various uh, things here. Oh. Okay. Okay. Five, six, four, three, three, three. But it's not there. It's where am I going to change this? Which ME is this one? Oh, I have to go to six. There you go. Now, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now we got a double, a double fisted chat room. Very nice. Very nice, but I'll go back to five here for the rest of the show. Good. Very good. Special K. Oh! Oh, I for oh, I like that even better. That's less of a <laughs> less of a long, long haul. <laughs> Thank you. I forgot about that. <laughs> Hashtag self cheers. <laughs> oh yeah. Ah, oh, this is good. I like having both chats in there. That's me. I'm the magic man. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number. Eight 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 two seven. 5536, toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Terry's on the, la on the line from Land O Lakes, Florida. Hello, Terry. Hey, how are you? I'm Good great. You. How are you? I'm well, thanks. My husband and I are actually in the car together. We're driving, and we were, we had wink phones and blink phones. I'm sorry, cameras, security cameras. Yeah. And the phone company made us upgrade our router modem well i think it's a two-part thing and um never since then we can't communicate with our cameras i've tried to go to blink to see if there was like an upgraded hub uh i'm a been unsuccessful i'm hoping you have some okay so uh, let me backtrack a little bit because i'm i'm not completely following this so you have these telephones or cameras which is it yeah. Say again? Cameras, I'm sorry. Camera. Oh, good. All right. That makes more sense. Yeah. And with the, one of the problems is that Wink um, changed their setup 
used to have a free base station. Did you get the email when they told you it's not free anymore? I've been paying them a <laughs> okay, good. amount of money a month. Okay, good. Because that was something that upset a lot of people. They had a Wink Hub, yeah. and all of a sudden they found out, wait, what? You're going to have to, you're going to charge me now? I have to subscribe? But you are fully subscribed. That's good. Five bucks a month, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's like six and change, I think. Oh, okay. I think they charge you if you have more than one camera. Got or something. it. So you get a little extra because you have multiple cameras. So that's so that's first thing is good. Your Wink subscription is up to date. Uh, you had to change your router out due to what? The, pho the phone company cable the provider said phone we're sending you a new one. You will oh. still install it. Okay. Else. Okay. Who's your Who's your internet service provider? I think it's Spectrum. Spectrum. Okay, so Spectrum sent you a new uh, cable modem slash router, all in one unit. You plugged it in. Yeah. All of a sudden, the cameras go, what? Uh, yeah. Did you set it up with the same login as before, same password? I can't get to it. Like, it doesn't <laughs> see it because it doesn't, it doesn't support 5.0 or 5G or whatever it's called. Now I'm really confused. Okay, so you got a new router, but nothing works at all? Even your laptop? Many things work. Some things don't. Many things work. Oh, good. Many things work. Okay. And you didn't change your password or anything. You just kind of, they put it in. Because normally a router will have a login and password that you need to use. Otherwise, your neighbors are going to start using it if it's what we call an open Wi-Fi network. We have that. It's not, the problem is that the Wink Hub... And the Blink Hub don't support 5G. So that's right. I'm trying to up, that's to that is correct. You need 2.4G. <laughs> that router should support both. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to work backwards. <laughs> no, it doesn't work backwards. You're exactly right. So here's the thing that you're gonna. This is tricksy, but uh, I think what you're gonna need to do is disable. You're gonna need to go into the router. And, and to do that, you're going to go to the, one of the laptops that you can access the router with. And there should have been instructions on how you log into the router's settings. Uh, yes. you, you'll lo log into the router's settings. It'll ask you for a password. You'll enter that password. And then look for a page in the router settings that says, turn off the 5G radio. You've got multiple radios in there for each band. The 5G radio may be confusing the Wink base station. Oh. In which case, all you have to do is turn off, just temporarily, turn off the 5G until the winks work. And then they go, oh, I see now. I was on the wrong one. Sometimes, okay. frequently, in order to save uh, confusion, companies will have the same exact name for the 5G and the 2.4G uh, routers. Even though they're discrete frequencies, it'll be the same name. I do that in my house. But that can confuse some devices that can't handle 5G. They'll join, they'll think they're joining the 2.4G, but they're really joining the 5G, and then they get no connectivity. I think that's what's happening to your Wink. So you have to somehow convince the Wink not to join the 5G, join the 2.4G. So there are a couple of things you could do. I mentioned one, which is turn off, at least temporarily, the 5G until the Wink works. Then usually you can turn the 5G back on. And the Wink shouldn't rejoin the 5G. If it does, then you might need to give names to the two frequencies. You might have to say, our house 2.4 and our house 5, just as long as they're distinct. And then tell the Wink, join the 2.4, my friend. Do not try to join the 5. Right. So you could actually, somebody's telling me on Spectrum they have an app. That might be easier to do that on the app. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah, see if the app... Uh, we'll do that. There is another way to do this. This is the <laughs> the manual way to do this, and I don't really recommend this. Uh, 5G does not travel as far or as well as 2.4G. It's great for in-house, but as you get farther away, it's weaker. Sometimes the solution, <laughs> I don't know how you're going to do this with the uh, cameras, uh, but, but sometimes the solution is to get farther away from the router. Like put the router at one end of the house and the Wink base station as far away from as you can. Sometimes it will then drop the 5 saying, well, that's too weak and go to the 2.4 by itself. <sighs> 
I think if, you know, so there's three different things you can do. Try just turning off the 5G if you can, if the Spectrum app lets you do that. Uh, and and then maybe the Wink will join the 2.4 and then you can turn it back on again and maybe everything will stay the same. If not, sometimes these, you know, these devices are dumb. These Internet of Things things. And they might go, oh, look, 5's back. Let's join that. They shouldn't, but they might. And then they will stop working again. In that case, you'll need to rename 2.4 and 5. And you can name them anything you want, but just as long as they're distinct names and tell the wink, join the 2.4. Failing that, walk away farther and farther and farther. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that helps. Thanks, Terry. It's great to talk to you. 8888-ASK Leo Elroy. I'm sorry. Eloy is on the line from Los Angeles. Hi, Eloy. Leo, how are you, sir? Wonderful. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Glad to have you. Welcome. Hey, um, I am a small system integrator, audio video contractor. Nice. Anyway, I, I'm trying to catch up with technology because, you know, that's growing dog ears. It's changing ears. every five seconds. How do you think I feel? <laughs> oh, I know. Um, I want to get an iPad that has a specific app for a device that's connecting for a client. And I just only want that thing to show that app. Only, and not go back to the home page. Oh, yeah, you want to lock the iPad down. Correct. Yeah, and app, Apple has uh, this feature for kids, but it'll work with clients because they're kind of like kids. Uh, it's called guided access. And the reason is when you're at a restaurant and you want the kid to shut up and you give him Phineas and Ferb, you don't want him to accidentally uh, zoom into work. So, <laughs> so you go to it's in the accessibility settings. That's the only weird thing they've hidden it away, as as is often the case in accessibility. Oh, really? But you could search if you go to okay. settings, search for guided access. Uh, you'll set a passcode because you don't want your five year old to figure out how to get around it. Right. <laughs> and uh, then. It'll be locked down into one app, and you can go to that iPad and enter the passcode and say, "No, no, let's let's use the iPad." So it's got, the key that you really all you need here is the words "guided access." So I don't need to delete anything else on nope. the home page. No, nope. it it as I said, it's designed uh, to be able to give an iPad to a kid and have them stay where in the app that you launched, ah. and uh, okay. kids and clients very similar. True. Yeah. True. So you're just going to get, you know, don't tell them what you've done, but they'll only be able to run that run app. So I guess you're using it as a kind of remote control app, something like that. And how about if they if, if they let the thing power off? Or same thing. Know. It'll power back up into the same app. Okay, good. So yeah. they, you know, somebody leaves it unplugged overnight, they come back and it's... Yep. Yep. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you actually go to, the, I'll put a link in the show notes, but go to the guided access page. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. And uh, you may get some ideas. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches. Phone number 8888 ask Leo, 888 827 5536. Toll free from anywhere in the US or Canada. Of course, you can still call uh, that number if you uh, use Skype out from anywhere in the world. 8888-ASK-LEO. Our website is techguylabs.com. And I mention that because uh, everything you hear on the show, we'll put links and so forth up at the website. So you can uh, go there. You don't have to write anything down. Even transcripts, audio, and video from the show after a couple of days will all go at techguylabs.com. And this is episode 1920, if you're looking specifically uh, for this information from today's shows. Back to the phone we go. Dave on the line from Boise, Idaho. Hello, Dave. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you guys? I am well. How are you? Not, not too bad. Hmm. Uh, it, it seems like if this if today had a theme, it would be Wi-Fi issues. Yeah, that's pretty much every day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just set up a, well, t a couple days ago, a an, an Orbi satellite uh, mesh router. Very system. nice. Netgear's Orbi is their mesh system, and it's a very good one. Yes, yes. I'm so far very happy with good, it. Good. Um, I get above the speeds that I'm paying for. Good. Um, wow. And I, and that's, I that's, that's rare. Usually the 
the speed they tell you is the absolute maximum you could ever get under perfect conditions with the wind at your back. But I guess your ISP is generous. That's good. I I guess so. And I tried different speed test apps to make sure that it was correct. Good, you know? good, good. Um, so my issue is I got everything set up, and this is, you know, it's it's uh, um, oh, it's Wi-Fi 6, and the issue is some of my, I guess I could say older uh, pieces of equipment, a printer, a couple of older TVs, I could not get them to connect. Oh, dear. Set up yeah. For WPA3. Um, and I couldn't get those to connect, and I did everything. I've looked on the Internet. I tried to find issues, you know, some way to solve the issues. So I thought, let me try downgrading that to WPA2 and see if that's the problem. Well, it is. Yeah. Everything yeah. connected again. That's not surprising. Yes. Yeah, so so is, the, is it just because... The smart TV is four years old. Yes. Is they didn't know about WPA3. Let me explain what we're talking about here. When you're using a wireless networking system, any Wi-Fi system, Wi-Fi. You, ideally you'd, you'd like to uh, encrypt it so that somebody just sitting around can't see what you're doing. Uh, they can't join it. And so we use an encryption system. The original Wi-Fi encryption system was WEP, wireless encrypted, or I'm sorry, wireless equivalent. Wired equivalent protocol. That's what it stands for. Wired equivalent protocol. In other words, they were saying, oh, this is as safe as wired. Well, it turns out it wasn't. <laughs> they, the Wi-Fi Alliance designed it without consulting any experts, and they designed it so poorly that it was easily broken. So then they went back and they did WPA, Wireless Protected Access, and uh, that had some problems. So they said, well, we'll do WPA2, that was good for a while, then somebody found a crack to that, so they, they announced WPA3. You actually uh, have a device that's so modern it supports the latest protocols, Wi-Fi 6 and WPA3. you got the latest Orbi. Uh, but not everything. It has to be understood on both ends, obviously. you know, If the Orbi's encrypting it using a technology that is not available on the TV, well, you're out of luck. Now, here's the good news. Yes, if everything were WPA3 compatible... Uh, it would be preferred. But WPA2 is not easily cracked. It's not. It's somebody has to sit on your curb for many hours and collect enough data packets from you to, to, to break WPA2. It's not going to happen. Uh, so don't worry about it. Use WPA2. This is not unusual, unfortunately. Uh, WPA3 was ratified in 2018. So your TV, you know... It, it's earlier than that, basically. Yes. Uh, and so one of the things here, and it actually is a is a note at the bottom of the Orbi app. It says, note, 6 gigahertz Wi-Fi supports only WPA3 encryption. Oh. Well, what? So that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, the good news yeah. is that TV definitely doesn't have a 6 gigahertz radio in it. <laughs> um, I oh, think so what they... I wonder if that means you you you're, it turns off the six gigahertz radio. That's interesting. Do you have any uh, Wi-Fi six uh, devices? Uh, I other than this router, I do not believe so. And my my iPhone, my iPad. Your iPhone might be. I think the latest the latest iPhone is Wi-Fi six. There's actually six E. Yeah. And I believe there's an Orbi that supports 6E. I don't know if you got that one, but uh, uh, no, yeah. no, 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 that's yeah. an upgrade from what I have. Yeah, uh, six requires devices that support Wi-Fi six. And by the way, in most cases, you won't see a difference. It, at best, you okay. know, ten uh, percent. You're already getting more than your internet service provider offers. I think you're True. fine. Security, I w- <laughs> security issue too, you know. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about it at this point. Um, All right. That's interesting. I have to look into that. It, that could be read two ways. It could be that uh, we're going to turn off the Wi-Fi six radio, right? Um, or it could be the Wi-Fi six radio stays. But I bet you can't say, oh well, okay. So for Wi-Fi six devices, let's use WPA three. They would all support it. Obviously, they're all new devices. 
but you probably can't set two different encryption protocols. Or maybe you can. Look in the settings. See if the... No, no. no. not able to. Believe yeah. me, I've done my homework the last two nights. That's uh, fascinating. Early. So that is, uh, that's, that's a drawback. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if that's a requirement of the Wi-Fi Alliance. If you're going to support six, you've got to do WPA3. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, or, or, yeah, I mean, for yeah, for six gig, gig, it needs to have that. And I, I'm guessing, just like probably with everything, as time goes on, the new, all new devices, all new smart TVs, all new printers, all that will have. Oh yeah, you know, everything will be WPA three. Everything released today is WPA three for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But well, but again, the problem with WPA two is not. It's 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 a very in my opinion, it's not. It's a minor problem. The real trick is to use a good password. Uh, don't don't just yeah. say monkey one two three. And normally, I don't really use a very strong password for Wi-Fi because I figure, well, who cares? But if you are worried, the better the password, the stronger WPA two is. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really do appreciate your time. I guess it is probably the fact that I just have some old equipment laying around, and that those were the three items that. Did not connect to it, so I appreciate. How that. interesting! You told me something. You've taught me something today, uh, and I'm glad to know because that you know, it's, as you pointed out, somebody's going to call me <laughs> and say my Wi-Fi <laughs> isn't working <laughs> on my TV, yeah, and now I will know why. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you for calling. Yeah, nothing to worry about. Use WPA2. That's fine. If WPA3 is available and everything works with WPA3, yes, that would be preferable. But WPA2 with a good password, long, strong password is fine. Uh, somebody would have to, you'd notice, <laughs> let's put it that way. You'd notice somebody camping out in your backyard for several hours. And boy, who's going to do that just to access somebody's Wi-Fi? You know, if this this more all of the, a lot of the security stuff we hear about isn't an issue for a normal person. It's an issue for people who work for agencies with three lettered names. It's an issue for uh, journalists in Saudi Arabia. It's not an issue for normal people. Yeah, if I were Scarlett Johansson, I'd make sure WPA three was turned on. But the rest of us, you know, fine, no problem. Who wants my, nobody wants my Wi-Fi traffic. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada outside that area. You could use Skype out. Lots of calls still to come in. We're going to try to call the Arctic and Rod Pyle in just a bit. Hot pants. <laughs> Whatever happened to Hot pants. <laughs> Leo Laporte, <laughs> hey, tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh, That's the phone number, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Uh, 45 minutes to go on the show, so it's, it's still a chance to get in, uh, like Henrietta from Oceanside, California. Hello, Henrietta. Hello, how are you? I am well, how are you? I'm doing well also. Good. Um, I, my husband and I did the update that you suggested a few days ago. Now I'm worried. What happened? Okay, well, it went fine for both phones, and I, I just purchased a new phone a couple of months ago, and I transferred all my information from my old phone to my new phone, but it, it all stayed on the old phone also, so I just kept it and I use it to listen to YouTube music. But this morning when I got up, it's got a screen as if it's a brand new phone, and it wants me to set it up. And on my new phone, it sent me an Apple ID code for setting it up. Oh, how funny. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have a separate telephone line for that one. Like I said, I was just using it for listening to music here in the house. Yeah, you should be able to keep doing that. I'm not sure what happened. Maybe, you know, Apple did just put out an urgent update to the iPhone, which uh, every... And, and by the way, in the Mac, which everybody should apply because... Uh, yes, this, you know, this. there's another update. Did we just add an update? Yeah, there's another update. This one's actually pretty important. Uh, you need to be on 15.6.1. Right, that's what we have. Oh, you already have that. Okay, and yeah. I wonder if that old phone, maybe did that not, had that not been updated? Uh, probably not. Because yeah. Because like I said, I only use it for music and I didn't yeah. see any messages on it until this morning when yeah. it acted like a new phone. Yeah, so overnight it updated. 
Uh, and this is important because this flaw that Apple discovered is what we call a zero day. It means no one knew about it until we saw it being used by bad guys. Yeah. So they wanted to fix that right away. Uh, and th it is the case on the iPhone that after, you know, a, a few weeks of uh, or a few days, just depends, the iPhone will self-update, uh, will auto-update. So that's what happened. And in that process, I guess the iPhone said, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> uh, I think it's completely safe to log into it and use it. It's uh, as if it were an iPad or uh, an, an, I, uh, an iPod. That's how you're using it, basically, is an iPod Touch. Right. You don't have to have a SIM in it, but you do have to be logged into your Apple account. So yes, I've seen, yeah, I've seen this happen before with an update where Apple just, I think, proactively says, let's just make sure this is who we, th you know, this really is Henrietta's phone. So just log in with your normal iCloud account on that phone, and I think you'll be fine. It's not going to, it's not going to. Use that Apple code that they gave me if they ask for a code. Yeah, the fo your new phone will sh pop up a code yes. and say, hey, somebody's trying to log into the old phone. In this low, you know, this person is in Oceanside. They show a little map. Is that okay? And you say yes, allow, and then they say okay. Well, here's a six-digit number, and that's the one you'll have to enter in the new phone. I mean, the old phone. Okay. But my new phone, it won't be affected. Uh, as far as I know, no, absolutely not. Because uh, okay. did you put a SIM card in, or is it an eSIM? It's a SIM card. Well, I'm not sure. I thought it was a SIM. When card. you went to the new phone, did you trans? Did you take a little chip out of the old phone and put it in the new one, or? Yes. Yes. Good. That that's that means that that new phone is your phone, and because it has that chip, the old phone can't be your phone. Okay, and it sent the message to that new phone because that's the only phone. Yeah, it had, that's right? what's logged into your Apple account. If you had a Mac and an iPad, it would send it to that as well. Yeah, I didn't think it would let me log. In. Well, no, I think the iCloud. Yeah, it is, should. Uh, it is on on the on the old phone because uh, sometimes yeah. when I'm looking at the messages, I get current messages on my old iPhone. I think it has to be. I'm not yeah. sure. I think Apple insists. Yeah. Uh, but the good and the, and from time to time, when the phone reboots, it might do that. I've had that happen with an update. I don't oh, know. Okay. I don't know what Apple's magic formula is for when they do or don't do it. But I think that's what happened, and that's fine. Just enter in the credentials and continue on. And it's safe. It should be safe. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It's a good question. And yeah, the good news, or maybe it's a bad news, I don't know. The good news is you'll continue to get uh, Apple's messages on that old phone because that's not a phone function. This is a very confusing thing about messages. You know, in the old days on your phone, your flip phone, you would get messages via SMS. Uh, those are SMS messages. And the phone company uh, routed them through its own system. And, and so forth. People, though, uh, started to move to programs like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal. There's dozens of these messaging programs. They don't use the phone company's technology. They don't use SMS. They use just plain old data, cell phone data. And so Apple, because they wanted to insist that you continue to use messages, not WhatsApp, not that Facebook program, not Google Hangouts, not somebody else's program. They wanted you to use Apple's messages. Decided, all right, we're going to make messages handle both SMS messages over the phone systems technology and data-based messages over, you know, the data connection, Wi-Fi, cellular, whatever that connection is. So your old phone, which no longer has a phone number and is no longer attached to the phone company's SMS message, system will not get SMS messages, but they'll continue to get the data portion of those messages. This is a source of infinite confusion, I might add, uh, with Apple's messaging program. In fact, Google just recently launched a campaign, which is destined to failure, to lobby Apple to start using their SMS-compatible system called RCS. And uh, the idea being, well, you know... <laughs> Apple Messages is so dominant. In fact, it's the only program you can use on an iPhone. We're going to have to strong arm Apple into using uh, RCS so that we will be equal to them on the Android phones. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> nice try, Google. <laughs> it, all that's going to happen 
is uh, is and <laughs> Apple users are just going to laugh at you and say, "Who cares? I don't care." Purple, blue, green. I don't care what color your bubble is. And uh, the only I think maybe the point of this. It's time for Apple to fix texting is to get Congress to do something about it. In fact, they have a hashtag, hashtag get the message. In fact, if you click the link on the web page, it'll create a tweet, complete tweet for you. Apple, stop breaking my texting experience. Hashtag get the message. Android.com slash get the message. Yeah, no, not going to tweet that. Sorry, Android. <laughs> It's just it's just silly. They're buying ads. You'll probably see an ad on the TV just warning you, get the message, Apple. Just so you know, for your background on this, Google's been pushing this rich communication system for some time. For a long time, even the phone companies didn't want to do it. They were very completely happy with SMS and its partner, MMS. Uh, in some cases, they were even making money on it. They didn't care. But uh, this blue bubble, green bubble thing, Google's just, you know, desperate to kind of get parity with Apple. I think it's, it's destined to failure. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I, don't, I just don't think we need to create more division. We've got enough division in this country. Why make more? Team blue, team green, forget the teams. You know, I just like playing this song. I don't, we don't need Rod Pyle. We just play this song because it makes me feel good. Rod Pyle, our space guy, would normally join us uh, at this time. He is up at the Arctic Circle in a, in a, par, a part of the uh, frozen north that uh, and NASA uses for testing rovers and other Mars equipment because it's such a Mars-like environment. And Rod's up there covering it for Space.com and his Ad Astra magazine. Uh, that's his publication for the National Space Society. So we don't know. The problem is he's up there. We don't know if he can hear us or reach us or anything. So he has to call via satellite phone. So I thought if I play the music, maybe in it, through the ether, Rod will get the message up in the uh, up in the Arctic Circle and and call us via Iridium satellite phone. But it may be that he just can't. So. Uh, no, no space news today. Rod does do a, a podcast you can listen to this week in space, and I think they pre-recorded it. I don't think they're doing that from the uh, Arctic Circle. Uh, Twit.tv slash TWIS this week in space. I think there was a lot of space news, actually. So I'm kind of sad we didn't get Rod on. And there were a few things I was going to tell him, you know, like he maybe he didn't know because he was out of touch. <laughs> But he is, he is spending the month on Mars via the Arctic Circle. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. Uh, his articles, by the way, are currently appearing on Space.com. If you uh, go to Space.com, you can see some images and his story uh, about how, how he's up there and what he's doing up there with the rovers and so forth. It's very cool. It's very cool. But you know what the good news is? It means I have more time for you. 8888-ASK-LEO. When is he going to be back, somebody's asking. It's a four-week trip. So I think he'll probably be back uh, in September, a couple of weeks. David's on the line from Orange County, California, our next call. Hi, David. Hello, Leo. I, I spoke to you last week. I had the seven-year-old unsupported Samsung phone, and you suggested maybe buying a new one, which I did. And the reason I'm calling is um, I was shocked that Almost all these phones now don't have notification lights. Yeah. And I found that to be the most useful thing on my I, That's a good point. I forgot about that. They used to have colored lights that would show up. The, uh, right. the Samsung the does have edge, uh, an edge display. And it's because it's, it's, it, I don't, which one did you get? The SC21, the 21 FE. Yeah. So that's a curved display. So you'll notice there's kind of a little lip. On the edge, if you turn on the edge display, it will show colors on that lip, on that edge, that you can kind of use as an airsatz notification light. But yeah, David, I'm sorry that there are two things that seem to have 
disappeared in the infinite wisdom of phone manufacturers, headphone jacks, and notification lights. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, yes. Yeah, it drives me nuts. I love it's my headphone like jack. useful thing. Yes. There's one thing, and I'm praying, you know, we're going to find out what the new Apple iPhone is going to look like. Um, September 7th is the rumor. And I'm just praying that Apple doesn't take the... They're the last phone that has a physical silence switch. That's so retro. I can't believe Apple still puts that on their phone. I have a feeling this may be the end of the line on that one. And then there's a rumor well, next year that they'll eliminate the uh, lightning port, that there'll be no ports on their phone. Good right. Lord. What, is, <laughs> what are I they thinking? So more battery because I'm checking it every five I know. minutes. I know. I missed a text. Or I know. A they, I mean, there's no fix for that except... Take a look at the edge menu, uh, the edge screens okay. in your settings. And then you can leave the phone on the desk, you know, with the edge showing. And it is kind of like a notification light. In fact, it's, it's even more sophisticated. But, I, yeah, I don't know if there's any uh, any phones left. That <laughs> no, they took me in Verizon. They said the whole store doesn't have any Unbelievable. notification lights. Unbelievable. And I'm just wondering why people accept that as as the norm. Yes. You know, it should be. You know, there is one uh, there's one company, and I wouldn't recommend the phone, but the Nothing phone is has a whole back of LED lights that they can use as notifications. So the Nothing phone is, I guess, the last one. Oh, and here's one from Oppo. The here's a phone you're never going to hear about: Reno Seven Pro. <laughs> It does have an LED. That's the last two. That's it. The Nothing Phone and the Reno 7 Pro. Stick with your FE. I think you're much. You're going to be much happier in the long run. That's a better Got phone. It. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I guess what you could do is set up a... What? We've got Rod Pyle? What? All right, well, I'll, I'll come up with a solution for that uh, another time. Let's, let's go to uh, space, or at least Mars. Space guy Rod Pyle. You must have heard the music and said, oh, it's time. <laughs> I wish I could hear your show. Uh, it was just I had some satellites to drift overhead. It kept disconnecting me. So oh, so you were trying to call, but this, but the satellite has to be right over your head. Wow. Oh yeah, because we go for long periods where we'll get a blip, and then we try to dial, it's rejected, and yada yada. But uh, here we are. So Yay! I just read your space dot com column. Are a month on Mars, trekking across the Arctic. Uh, your pictures are coming across. Flags and footprints right. on the moon. Actually, you just posted that one. Very cool stuff. Really cool stuff. Yeah, so I think we're up to about five posts. I've got a total of 14 coming, so they're running a little behind. But we got another, a little under a week here. We did get the weather to turn on us, uh, unfortunately. So we got some kind of ice station zebra weather going oh, on. No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> The raining sideways and the wind and, you know, triple, triple wool socks. And we just sit and shiver in our tent. Oh, like that does not sound but, fun. Oh, well, the adventure, you know? Yeah. So tell me preparing to come up to bring a lot of wool and you. Uh, yeah, we're not going that way, I don't think. Uh, have you gotten a chance to? No. no. <laughs> I know you're at the Hot and Mars Project Base, I know. Uh, have you had what, what? What cool things have you been doing when when it's not snowing sideways? Well, it, so it hasn't snowed yet. It's all been, been icy rain. We've gone on uh, three traverses, so they've got a fleet of ATVs up here and uh, a couple of Humvees. The Humvees aren't being used this season, but we took the ATVs out. We did you know like thirty, forty mile traverses into the crater and around the crater and picking up samples, and then we there was an ATV that they had left an all-terrain vehicle they had left about 16 miles away last season they were here 2018 2019 and uh they decided to go retrieve it so we all went trundling out there and it's this kawasaki i think a 2012 vintage atv that have been sitting out there for four years and you know it's not like there's a problem with the neighborhood nobody's going to steal it right because <laughs> there's nobody here but we got there we charged the battery, put a little gas in it. Things started up like it was just off the factory floor. It was unbelievable. Oh, that's fantastic. So you went on a rescue mission. That's cool. And then a little further down to uh, visit the Humvee that they have that they had left about <laughs> five more miles down the road because they were trying to trying to identify the best trail to the uh, coast of the island because they wanted to bring a pressurized NASA rover in that way. So they were trying to trailblaze it with the Humvees. 
But they got about halfway there, and the mud was just so bad that it had, they had to stop. So that one they'll bring back probably next year. And then once we got there, we did some experiments with a uh, with a drone that was doing for reconnaissance and in balloons. So it's all very exciting and fun to watch, and I'm documenting it. It's great. So you helped create the flag for this 2022 season at the Arctic. I created the old flag. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the flag. Oh, we're losing. We're, I think the satellite is no longer overhead. <laughs> Internet of Earth. Yeah, it's breaking up. This is a. This is a. Is this an old flag? The uh, the the uh, H.G. Wells uh, Martian probe. Yeah, we lost him. Standing astride the Earth with the angry red planet flag behind it. I love that one. Look, if you want to see the flags, this one honors uh, Ernest Shackleton and his effort to reach the South Pole in 1907, go to space.com. Whole series of articles by Rod. Up there in the Arctic, he'll be back home soon. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, I'm sorry it was truncated, but that was awesome. It was awesome to hear from Rodney. Safe travels, yeah. It's amazing. It's sad. That is a real plug for the Kawasaki, isn't it? Rod Nick of the North. <laughs> oh, Rod, we lost you. I'm sorry. Oh, oh. We lost you. I'm sorry, Rod. We're at we're in the podcast now. We're out of the uh, main thing. Those flags are cool yeah, though. Yeah. It, uh, next week I'll be back on on terra firma next Sunday, so we'll have a regular call. Okay, now tell me the truth. Did you grow a big arctic beard? It's certainly gotten shaggy, yeah. And unfortunately, I think I'm having an arctic belly to go with it because we've been eating a lot of high carb food. So we'll see when I get back. You I'll can't gain to... weight up there. You're burning calories galore. That's what I thought, but uh, <laughs> I'm a pants a little snug. We'll see. <laughs> well, I hope I hope you've been having fun. It sounds like you have. I'm sure though you'll be glad to get home too. Yeah, absolutely. I would just be glad to be somewhere where it stays above 40 degrees most yeah, of the time. That would yeah, be good. Yeah. yeah. What an adventure, though. I mean, this is a, you and I are never going to get into space, I don't think, but at least you got to do this. That's cool. Well, and after being here, and this place is so much like Mars. There's not a plant. There's not a Coke bottle. There's no graffiti. There's no garbage. There's no roads. There's no, even for scale for a photograph. There's no trees. So I really feel like you're on another planet. And I kind of feel like I've done it. I don't have to sit in a spaceship for seven months to get there. So nice. I'm good to go. Yeah, I feel like there's plenty yeah. to explore on good old planet Earth. I'm content to do that. I, I think so. I'll, I'll join you for that. <laughs> Rod, a pleasure. Thank you so much. I can't wait to talk to you next week. Thanks. Take care. All right. Rod Pyle in the Great White North. Thank you for let me be your tech guy once again. Man, do I did I did I win the lottery or what? Thanks to uh our great musical director. Laura does such a good job playing that music. And thanks to Kim, Kim Schaffer, who answers your phone calls and gets you on the air. And thanks most of all those of you who listen to the show. And uh, you know, keep sending signals to the the folks in the in the uh, in the in the big office building down the road. That, that yes, people listen to Leo. Keep it on the air, please. Thank you. <laughs> I I am my I thank you. My father thanks you. My brother thanks you. My sister thanks you, and I thank you. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. Uh, let's keep taking calls until they till they pull the plug. We're gonna keep taking calls. Larry is on the line from Manhattan Beach, California. Hello, Larry. Hey, Leo, how are you? I am well. How are you? I mentioned this. Good. I mentioned this before. I'm a recovering Windows user. Oh, I'm so sorry. And, I uh, yeah. And also, I took you. I know. I took your advice a number of years ago and started using LastPass. So I didn't have to remember all my passwords. Good man. And I was doing some cleanups on my Mac the other day, and I noticed that my M1 Mac has version four point 
one of LastPass, and it doesn't want to upgrade. And my MacBook Pro Intel is version 4.4 of LastPass. And you can add LastPass as an extension to Safari. <sighs> and my Android has 5.1 LastPass. So, so do I even need the LastPass application on my Macs, or do you just need the browser extension and leave it at that? And what the heck is going on with LastPass and Apple? Yeah, LastPass, which was a sponsor uh, and, and for years was my uh, number one choice in password managers. I know. Still a very good password manager. You know what happened to them? They were purchased by LogMeIn uh, several years ago. LogMeIn then sold them. Uh, in fact, they sold it all to an equity company. And the equity group spun out LastPass. So the, I think this is good news in the long run for LastPass. They are now a standalone company once again. So they've gone through some transitions. And of course, every time there's a transition, you know, products come and go and so forth. The last thing I heard from LastPass, and I think this is still true, is that they don't want to make a standalone app for the M1 Max. That they are, in fact, going to continue to support M1 as a browser extension but so you won't need the app anymore. This is, by the way, the exact opposite of what they used to say, which is don't install the browser extension, install the app, and then we'll automatically put the browser extension on whatever browsers you use. It's, 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 it's very confusing. But as I said, yeah. I think the confusion comes from the fact that uh, new masters every few years is not, never a good thing. But I think finally LastPass should start to settle down. Um, so, yeah, I understand your confusion <laughs> um i mean so would your advice be to just um, delete the apps off the off the uh, macbook it's you know here's the good news about uh, apple's m1 strategy they provide uh this thing called rosetta rosetta 2 in the case of the m1 that is a, a, a translation layer between intel and the m1 silicon that works very very well and there's no reason not to continue to use it as far as i'm concerned um, you know, I'm a, you know, I understand I'm a kind of a purist. I could, you know, initially when I first got my M1, oh, I'm not going to install any of that Intel stuff. But as it turns out, there's still a lot of programs you, you might want. And, uh, so I would say, yes, it's fine to continue to use the app. Let me just see what I'm, I'm at the last pass release notes. I'm just curious in what they're saying about this. They do have the new and improved save and fill experience. Anything about this online? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, because a lot of people are like, "What's what? What's going on?" Um, I would say continue to use the app until they deprecate it. Until they say, "Don't use the app anymore." Uh, it's not in the App Store, by the way. If yeah. The App Store. Looking yeah. Places, you will not find it. So they they put out with version uh, 1.1 of the app, they uh, put out uh, support for Monterey, the latest uh, operating system. Um, it looks like, I mean, it looks like they're still developing it, This, but this was May of this year. The most recent release, which is 4.99.0, and that sounds to me like that's the browser extension, right? That came out July 8th. Um, and I don't see any release of uh, the app past May. So it may well be, even for Windows, believe it or not, it may well be that they are just, this is a new strategy. I, I don't know anybody over there anymore. So I don't have anybody well, to... Windows, you know, all I have is the browser extension. Yeah, I think they've done it on both, okay. both platforms. They had a UWP Windows uh, app that you could get in the Windows Store. I don't know if that's gone as well. This is interesting. Yeah, I'll have to... Um, I'll, I'll, let me do some research. I'll call somebody over there and say, Who, who's in charge now? <laughs> Who, tell me, <laughs> what's going on with LastPass? Uh, if at some point you really... I mean, I like the app, but really most of the time you use it in the browser, right? In fact, when I need a password, I just go to the browser and use the extension. So, right. I think I'm, I'm, I'm bullish oh, for the future like of LastPass because they spun it out as a standalone. I, I think that that was the right I thing know to you do. Like Bitwarden. So, so the question is, how painful is it to switch from LastPass? Oh, to it's Bitwarden? okay. Shh, it's easy. <laughs> so, Bitwarden is a sponsor. They replaced LastPass when LastPass decided to <laughs> go through these changes. Um, and I actually love. I I really prefer Bitwarden because it's open source. And one of the things LastPass did at the end of the, you know, line on this, when they were still with the equity 
uh, investment company was they turned off the free version and made people upgrade. And now there was a lot of anger over that. Bitwarden, which is open source, will always have a free version that's full featured. Uh, the transition is trivial. LastPass will save, you will export your passwords. Uh, actually, that might be one reason to keep that app going because that they used to say that's the best way to export it. So maybe now's the time while the app is available, <laughs> export from the app into a CSV or LastPass format and Bitwarden will import that directly without any loss of content uh the only thing i noticed maybe some trouble with i uh i always put my pictures of my driver's license and passport in my uh password manager i think i had to take new pictures as i remember but but all of the passwords came through fine so it's a very easy transition to make and, and you have to i mean if you ask me uh yeah i know bitwarden is a sponsor but i do prefer it to last pass and it's under constant uh, update yeah one more, one more really quick thing i don't i think it's quick anyway if i could uh i keep getting messages from apple that my icloud storage is getting full <laughs> and to my knowledge i'm not storing anything in oh iCloud. you are you just don't know it <laughs> so go to icloud.com log on to your account there and they'll tell you what you've got photos go up there uh, you may be backing up. It is by default on Mac OS, your desktop and your documents. If that's the case, yeah, you'll fill it up fast, but you can turn that off. And Apple's, uh, Apple's iCloud is more expensive than a lot of other solutions. Well, the time has come to say goodbye to all our friends and family. Thank you so much for joining me on the Tech Guy Show. Remember, we put show notes up on the website, and this is free. There's no uh, charge. You don't have to give me your email or anything like that. It's completely free and private. Techguylabs.com. Uh, Micah and, uh, and John will be putting up the links uh, as time goes by. We'll also get audio and video from the show, our podcast version of the show. Techguylabs.com, episode 1920. A little plug for the podcast network. When you get there, you'll see many other shows I do all week long for the geek in all of us, twit.tv. So techguylabs.com, and I'll see you there. Meanwhile, have a great Geek Week. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, twit, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. And on, and of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. <laughs>